Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach. I'm your host for this evening. And as usual, we're continuing with our uh, Theory Fridays, where we go through leftist literature. Uh, we, we do the, the audiobook stream, or the audiobook version of a usually a classic piece of literature. And then I, I stop to comment on it and, and field your questions and, and all that good stuff. So tonight we are doing part two of uh, The Principles of Communism by Frederick, or Friedrich, I should say, Engels, uh, one of the, the co-authors of the Communist Mon Manifesto and great friend to Karl Marx. So if you were here last stream, uh, you may remember that, that last time, basically what Engels was doing was he was laying out his vision of how things are. Um, he made a case for uh, why the the capital system is inherently exploitative and why it, it needed to be changed. Uh, and now we're going to learn a lot more about what sort of a communist society uh, he is envisioning. So um, he's going to go into things like what, what a family structure might look like, what, what, how work would be divided, um, how you would function in the new style of economy and political landscape and that sort of thing. So as always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I, I always uh, will do my best to uh, answer any sort of good faith question that comes through. So it doesn't matter if you agree with this sort of philosophy, as long as you're coming in with, with good intentions, I'll do my best to, to engage with you likewise. Um, so having said that, let's get into tonight's book. So we are just about halfway through. We're, we're almost certainly going to finish up the book for tonight. Uh, it, it's really more of an essay than a book. It's, it's fairly short. I think the whole thing is 48 minutes or so. So, uh, but, it, but it's, it's what people tend to think of, or tend to think they're getting into when they crack open the Communist Manifesto. It, this, is, this is more getting into uh, the meat of, of communist ideas more so than the Communist Manifesto, which is more or less uh, an advertisement trying to get people excited about joining the Communist Party and, and joining the movement to end capitalism. But this, this is more uh, speculative, uh, more theory-focused, and um, yeah, I, I hope you enjoy it, and uh, away we go. Will the peaceful abolition of private property... Oh, and, and one more thing. Uh, we are, we are looking at the video from Socialism for All, so go ahead and give them a, a sub on YouTube. They do really great audiobooks. Like, the, the, the narration is just perfectly crisp and clear. You can tell they, they put a lot of time and effort into it. Things are divided out. Uh, it may be hard to see from the stream, but each little section of this book, which is more or less a chapter, uh, it is divided into uh, sections that you can skip to, so you can read it much like you would a book. You can skip chapter to chapter. So a really great job that they do. Uh, go check them out as well. Continuing on. Property be possible. It would be desirable if this could happen, and the communists would certainly be the last to oppose it. Communists know only too well that conspiracies are not only useless but even harmful. They know all too well that revolutions are not made intentionally and arbitrarily, but that everywhere and always they have been the necessary consequence of conditions which were wholly independent of the will and direction of individual parties and entire classes. But they also see that the development of the proletariat in nearly all civilized countries has been violently suppressed, and that in this way the opponents of communism have been working towards a revolution with all their strength. I mean, that, that is still the case today. We, we see it in, in any sort of a, a protest movement against uh, the forces of capitalism within the United States or another so-called Western country. Uh, violent repression by uh, the police and military, especially when it's coming from the left side. Um, you, you can just contrast how, how little resistance, say, the January 6 rioters faced when, when they stormed the Capitol and literally in many instances were waved on by the people that were supposedly guarding uh, the, the full session of Congress that was taking place uh, at the time that they, 
attempted their coup, insurrection, whatever it is you want to call it, there definitely was potential for violence. Thankfully, uh, it was it was minimized, we'll say. Um, but 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 the point being, contrast that to to how any sort of uh, movement that that's that's talking about the up, upliftment of of workers or or otherwise oppressed people look at how that is treated in in this country in particular um, about this time last year there were the the uh fly the the riots or riots the the demonstrations around um uh for uh in support of, of george floyd and and the injustice that happened to him were taking place and we had the National Guard called in uh, to, to this very city, to, to St. Paul, as well as Minneapolis, to, you know, put down any, any potential uprising. Um, this, is, this is evident, especially in, in the way the U.S. and other so-called Western countries deal with uh, any sort of left-wing movement around the world. They will do whatever they can to discredit it. They will, they will send in uh, CIA operatives to, to work from within to try to sow chaos and confusion. They will install puppet dictators, almost always right-wing dictators if they can. They'll do whatever they can to suppress any sort of socialist or communist or anarchist tendency from gaining any sort of a foothold. Uh, so, so nothing's really changed since then. There's still that, that antagonism between the dominant system, which is, which is still capitalism, and anything that seeks to oppose it. So haven't really gotten, I mean, in some ways we've progressed, but in, in some ways we're still fighting those same old battles. And, and remember, this was, this was published in 1847, so over 150 years ago. Now it would be, what, 174 ish years yeah about 174 years since this was published and him he's still talking about these these uh tensions between uh, right-wing governments such as capitalism or right right-wing economies and, and the governments that support them and any sort of movement that that seeks to uh win better equality and and uh fairness democracy freedom for average working people Let's continue. If the oppressed proletariat is finally driven to revolution, then we communists will defend the interests of the proletarians with deeds as we now defend them with words. 17. Will it be possible for private property to be abolished at one stroke? No. No more than existing forces of production can at one be stroke multiplied to the extent necessary for the creation of a communal society. And that's, that's an interesting contrast between... Uh, what Engels thought and, and what Peter Kropotkin thought. Uh, if you were here for the last book that we did, which was The Conquest of Bread, Kropotkin said that it had to happen at the same time. We basically couldn't hold on to these vestiges of, of the capitalist system, uh, the, even the market system anymore. We had to get rid of it in one fell swoop. Otherwise, it would, it would open the door for authoritarianism and and rule by the, the few elite to, to creep back in. That was his thought. Uh, for myself personally, I, I think I would tend to agree more with, with Engels here that, that, I mean, even for people that, that you know, swim in these waters constant, all the time, are, are familiar with different leftist ideas and talking points and, uh, and theories, it's really hard to imagine a world without money or markets or anything like that, where everything is just centrally uh, planned in, in the case of, of a communist um, the regime is not the right word, but a communist uh, society, uh, centrally planned, distributed and, and um, maintained, or in the case of an anarchist society where, where people spontaneously create systems to mutually aid one another. Uh, it's still hard to, to even fathom the idea of just doing away with, with money entirely. It's hard for myself as well. And, and I've been you know, studying this for 
at, at least a couple years now, more seriously. Um, so yeah, so I, I would tend to agree with a more slow progression from the society we have now uh, to, to uh, any sort of leftist society. So I think I think that's that's a more of a pragmatic approach that that Engels is talking about right now. Hello to uh, St- uh, Sam. I think was was your nickname, right? If if I'm remembering right. Uh, how are you tonight? How are you doing? Uh, ready for some communist theory tonight? We're going to to finish up the principles of communism, and we're going through what Engels is is envisioning. We're we're getting to the real meat of it now, of how he envisions a a communist society to. Um, to function. So we, so the question that he's answering right now is whether or not we can just abolish private property in one fell swoop. And, and again, it's important to remember that when leftists talk about private property, what they mean is the means of production, whether it's factory machinery, whether it's intellectual property, uh, whether it's uh, the ability to perform a particular service. Those are all the means of production. That's all private property. Uh, as opposed to to personal property, which is things that you need to just keep on living, your your personal home, your your personal means of transportation, your personal food, stuff like that. So important distinction. All right. Well, let's continue on and, and see what he says about uh, the process of of weaning ourselves from a, a moneyed society. In all probability, the proletarian revolution will transform existing society gradually and will be able to abolish private property only when the means of production are available in sufficient quantity. 18. What will be the course of this revolution? Above all, it will establish a democratic constitution and through this, the direct or indirect dominance of the proletariat. Direct in England, where the proletarians are already a majority of the people. Indirect in France and Germany, where the majority of the people consists not only of proletarians, but also of small peasants and petty bourgeois, who are in the process of falling into the proletariat, who are more and more dependent in all their political interests on the proletariat, and who must therefore soon adapt to the demands of the proletariat. Perhaps this will cost a second struggle, but the outcome can only be the victory of the proletariat. Also interesting here to, to notice the, the parallels between this book and uh, The Conquest of Bread. Kropotkin talked also about um, how in many of these, these European countries the, uh, the proletariat was, was quickly, f- or the people were falling quickly from the middle class into the proletariat as the Industrial Revolution rolled on and, and swallowed up more and more of the, the old style of, of business. A lot of people found themselves reduced to, to basically labor for hire, uh, which became the new form, the new dominant form of, of capitalism, which we more or less have today. Um, so yeah, interesting to, to see his thought process of, of the way these, these two transitions would go based on the material conditions on the ground. And that's what, what communism uh, is, is really focused on. It's, it's that Things are going to be different. They're going to look different. Revolutions will look different depending on the material conditions that, that people see. Where there are more proletariat, you have more strength and, and more of a, a will, a collective will uh, and, and reason to overthrow the ruling classes. Uh, if there's less of a proletariat and, and more of a strong middle class, uh, things can't be as direct because... Not only will you get resistance from the top, but but the middle class as well, who have fought so hard to get to their, you know, relatively comfortable position, will more or less, will more than likely oppose you as well. And we can see that in in movements such as Black Lives Matter, where constantly people are are, are debating about the the ways in which they go about protesting to to usually get around. The message that they're actually trying to to serve so whether it's it's blocking traffic or taking a knee or what have you middle class loves to to latch on to the the methods that they use well it can't be violent or you can't break any windows uh, if if there's one broken window it's a violent mob uh, if a few people light a, f- a building on fire that that 
brush gets just slathered all over uh, everyone who was there or or you know even if they weren't there at the time that it happened if they came later they, they still get put in that same sort of uh, uh, bucket of people I guess uh, in the minds of, of the middle class and and one reason they do that is so that they don't have to face these difficult questions that are being raised and, and these these points of of stress uh, that that these movements are, are pointing out so Sam says uh, or Strin says I think normie capitalists don't realize how much the middle class has dissipated and how the proletariat class is growing and it's an interesting thing in in the US there's there's a huge there's a huge group of the middle class in the US that that doesn't really do any productive work uh, if you've ever read David Graeber's bullshit jobs he goes into this extensively how there's this this huge like especially the managerial class of of the middle class uh, there's this huge group of people that do you know work on paper in 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 one form or another whether it's just managing other people whether it's uh fulfilling um oh he, he divided into things like duct tapers people that that uh constantly take a bad system and, and, and repair it, even though it's just going to fail again and again. Uh, people that um, just have underlings to, to make themselves look good, uh, that, that these underlings don't really do anything. But anyway, there's this, this huge group of people in the middle class that, that don't really do any sort of meaningful or worthwhile work at all. Um, and yet they get paid very well for it. So it's, it's all it's just this kind of inflated um, inflated uh, picture of production that that you know doesn't really hold up when you when you scrutinize it at all. It's a really great book. I'd, I'd highly recommend it to, to anyone. It's Bullshit Jobs by David Graeber, the late great David Graeber. I think he died just about a year ago. In fact, um, very sad. He had a lot more. Would have had a lot more years in him to produce really great works like he's done. But let's continue on here. Democracy would be wholly valueless to the proletariat if it were not immediately used as a means for putting through measures directed against private property and ensuring the livelihood of the proletariat. The main measures emerging as the necessary result of existing relations are the following. One, limitation of private property through progressive taxation heavy inheritance taxes, abolition of inheritance through collateral lines, brothers, nephews, etc., forced loans, etc. Two. So he's talking about using legal means to, to wear down the, the power and, and the force of, of the owner class, and even, and even the, the smaller-time owners. Um, Trying to break up, at the very least, these these sort of dynasties that still take place in in supposedly free countries, uh, or or countries free of of monarchy, such as the United States, where people just inherit companies, they inherit uh, enough money to start whatever business they they feel like. I mean, you look at at pretty much any uh, of the so-called great men of history: Jeff Bezos, um, Elon Musk. Bill Gates, all these, all these people, <laughs> Donald Trump as well, all these people ha built their fortune uh, starting with, with some sort of, of benefit from their own family. Um, so, so what his policy would be would be to just do away with that, to institute very heavy, you know, what, what the rich like to call death taxes, where, where you have uh, uh, what... Uh, so if you have like an estate, you tax that heavily once the, the um, former owner passes away. Um, you, you abolish the idea of, of just having money go to family members. Um, the idea is just breaking up these, these powerful dynastic lines where people are just rich generation after generation after generation. Um, 
gradual expropriation of landowners, industrialists, railroad magnates and ship owners, partly through competition by state industry and partly through direct compensation in the form of bonds. Okay, so he's, he's talking about nationalizing these large industries that were, were starting to dominate uh, the economy, even in his time, and which now, you know, every, every sector you look in, uh, it's dominated by some large player or, or a few. Uh, so, so his idea is to then set up uh, parallel industries. You, you know, he's talking mostly about industry. It could be anything, though. Uh, it could be any sort of business. But setting up parallel businesses and, and industrial ventures to use the large force of the state to outcompete these private enterprises and, and eventually the idea is to, is to buy them out um, or just to, to outright expropriate it from them, which, which means take from. So that may, that may be something that, that a lot of people bristle at, the idea of just taking property from you know, people that worked really hard to, to get where they're at and, and build up these, these large industries. But you always have to keep in mind the cost that, is, uh, that goes along with building up these, these industries, the, the hundreds, thousands, of, of tens of thousands of workers that, that had to be exploited, to had to have their, their, the fruits of their labor skimmed off uh, constantly to, to build the companies up to the size they are, the great crimes that, that are committed in the name of these industries, especially when we talk about uh, U.S. imperialism, um, going into other countries to uh, lay the groundwork for them to, the, these large companies come in and basically have no competition, all for the benefit of the U.S. economy. Um, there are great crimes that, that happen every day in, in, in small and large ways to build up these companies. So taking them back, by comparison, it, it, you could definitely say that, that, or you could definitely see it in a way where it wouldn't be nearly as great of a crime, uh, especially when y your aim is to, to set things right and to give the means of production back to the proletariat and, and have a government and, and a country ruled by the proletariat. If you remember back to the, the ill-named concept of the, the dictatorship of the proletariat, what that literally means is, is the workers decide the fate of the country. They, they become the government and, and they do things more or less democratically. It, it may still be a representative form. There's, there's different forms that communism can come in. Uh, so you may elect uh, the head of your particular business to go to represent you uh, in, a, in a council of large businesses or a council of all businesses. Uh, it may be more direct where, where workers, you know, directly vote on, on things more. Uh, there's, there's many forms that can come in. So just 20 minutes ago, you were thinking to yourself uh, how the lack of inheritance taxation is one of the biggest ways that the rich get to keep what they have. That, that absolutely is true. I mean, it, it, the rich always whine about it as, as though it's this huge injustice to take any cent that, that uh, their family has amassed because it's, it's owed to them. I mean, really, talk about entitlement. It's, it's literally money that you yourself have not earned, but you think that you are owed it because the happenstance that your rich relative died. But aside from that, the, 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 uh, the estate tax that, that is usually talked about when we talk about uh, inheritance taxes, this affects a few hundred families, maybe 400 families in the United States, maybe a few thousand worldwide. This is, this is, this is the wealthiest of the wealthiest of the wealthiest. You know, talk, it, this is way above the 1%. This is, as, as Bernie Sanders would say, like the top one-tenth of the top one-tenth of the 1%. Uh, these are the people that would be affected. And it's not that many people, but they do take a lot of wealth out of the system by just giving it to each other generation after generation. So you're absolutely right. And you say, all the profits they've kept for themselves throughout the years, we can never get back. Well, yeah. So he's talking about one of the first orders is to start taking it back for ourselves. Because more or less it is ours, you know. 
it, it, it was produced by the efforts of the workers, taken just because of the, the uh, position that the worker, or, excuse me, that the owners were in to be able to decide what happens with profits in the business. They just happened to decide to put it in their own pockets most of the time. Uh, so this is just, he's just talking about taking it back, really, uh, more than anything. But let's continue on a little bit more. Three, confiscation of the possessions of all immigrants and rebels against the majority of the people. Four, organization of labor or employment of proletarians on publicly owned land, in factories and workshops, with competition among the workers being abolished, and with the factory owners, insofar as they still exist, being obliged to pay the same high wages as those paid by the state. Five, an equal obligation on all members of society to work until such time as private property has been completely abolished. Formation of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Six, centralization of money and credit in the hands of the st state through a national bank with state capital and the suppression of all private banks and bankers. Seven, increase in the number of national factories, workshops, railroads, ships, bringing new lands into cultivation and improvement of land. So th this is going by really fast. Like I'm, I'm, you know, even myself, I'm having trouble processing it, uh, these, these points as he goes through them very quickly. But overall, what I see is, is him talking about is, is the complete transformation of the economy to, to be uh, run and controlled by the workers. He talked about having a mandate of, of workers to keep working until there's no private property left. This would be uh, basically the idea that we, we, we can't let up on, on the capitalists uh, once we have an advantage over them. We need to keep going. We need to keep pushing until they are, are pushed out of the economy altogether. And then we can talk about uh, things like slowing down our work. But, but until that point, it's, it's basically an all-hands-on-deck sort of situation. And he's talking about drastically re rearranging the way that industry goes. And, and setting up all these, these um, worker-owned industries, whether they already exist and you're just expropriating them and giving them to the workers, or whether you're creating them from the, the centralized power of the state, which is, again, controlled by the, the proletariat, ideally. It's important to keep this in mind and we're, when we're talking about theoretical communism. You know, you can quibble about the ways that, that it has played out, in various countries, whether or not any country has gotten to that point where workers have substantial control over the means of production. But in theory, we're just talking about the theory point right now. That's how it's supposed to go, at least in my understanding. Land already under cultivation, all in proportion to the growth of the capital and labor force at the disposal. <laughs> they should try some lib streams. Yeah, no, no advertising here, at least no free advertising. Disposal of the nation. Eight. Although always happy to to shout out anyone who, who does stream themselves. So if you happen to be in the audience at any time, uh, I'm now using Nightbot. Hey there, just uh, uh, popped up using Nightbot. So so just just let me know that you stream in one way or another, and I'll I'll shout you out. Always happy to help out comrades who are who are helping to bring these ideas to more and more people. I think that's one of the most important things we can do to lay the groundwork for any sort of a transformation of society, no matter which way it, it might break, uh, is to at least give the people some ideas about where things can go. Oh, your internet went down. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I was saying anything uh, about the, the, the book itself while you were gone. I was just saying... Um, if anyone happens to be a streamer who is in, in the audience and they would like to be shout out at any time, let me know. I, I have Nightbot in the, in the chat right now, so I, I have that all set up to give people shout outs. I always love helping out comrades who are doing the same sort of thing, trying to at least start helping people dream past uh, that left wall of capitalism and hopefully someday literally push society past that left wall of capitalism. Uh, past liberalism, uh, you know, past even democratic socialism, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, just getting rid of capitalism as a system. This is important groundwork that we're laying. Um, 
just so that people have an idea of what is possible, you know, so they've at least been exposed to other ideas if and when any sort of a change is, is uh, able to be pushed through. Education of all children from the moment they can leave their mother's care in national establishments at national cost. Education and production together. Nine, construction on public lands of great palaces as communal dwellings for associated groups of citizens engaged in both industry and agriculture and combining in their way of life the advantages of urban and rural conditions while avoiding the one-sidedness and drawbacks of each. Mm. It's an interesting use of, of palace there. I don't quite know what he means other than perhaps just a large, you know, nice looking structure. But I, I don't know why he's describing it that way. Uh, but but I guess the, the main point is that he's talking about setting up communes for these, these different types of work where people can then gather, have a social life, and, and do things like agriculture, which can probably be pretty isolating. I, I've never done farming myself. I have, I've helped people plan their farms uh, using permaculture, but I, I've never actually... I mean, I've done gardening, I do landscaping now, I've done similar work, but I've never actually been out on the land, you know, raising crops to, to then sell at market or, or, you know, ship them overseas or whatever, what, what have you. I imagine it can be isolating, though. And so I think that, you know, he's going through this very fast. This is, this is very much a thumbnail sketch of, of these ideas. But I think what he's getting at is, is the idea of having this be a communal collaborative effort it not just in the sense that we all work together and we all share in the in the in the profits from things but social life as well so so the life outside of work also is a collaborative effort so i think i i'm guessing that's what he's getting at 10 destruction of all unhealthy and jerry built dwellings in urban districts 11 sure um if we're talking about taking over buildings that are unoccupied right now, um, I mean, literally in the U.S. right now, we have, ooh, what was it last time I looked it up? Something like 60 to 70 uh, vacant units for every homeless person. Uh, I think we could probably accommodate anyone that's in substandard housing as well. And, and in places like the U.S., it's not as common to have, you know, structurally deficient to the point of, of falling down. Of, of course, you know, as, as Florida has, has proven lately, uh, it, there are exceptions uh, through, through greed and, and um, just <laughs> dereliction of duty, I guess. Uh, people can let things get to the point where buildings are not safe. Uh, but by and large, buildings don't tend to fall down just because they're structurally deficient. You know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a huge, uh, it's not an industry really, it's usually a government service of, of building in, uh, inspectors that, that tend to keep things at least to a, a minimum standard of habitability. But yeah, they, you know, with, with all this vacant property right now, I'm sure we could house anyone that's, that's in some sort of a housing deficiency. Seven, equal inheritance rights for children born in and out of wedlock. Twelve. That seems to a little bit contradict his, his talk of doing away with, with most forms of inheritance. Um, but I think what he's trying to do is is put people on more of an even playing field, saying that, that there shouldn't be the special set aside uh, for the children of married people. I don't even know how that works right now. Like I, like I myself... Um, divorced my, my ex-wife who we had kids together or we have kids together uh, I would assume that they could still inherit my property even though I, I, I don't live with them but I don't know I don't know per perhaps we've gotten to that point and, and this would be unnecessary now but perhaps not concentration of all means of transportation in the hands of the nation it is impossible of course to carry out all these measures at once but one will always bring others in in its wake. Once the first radical attack on private property has been launched, the proletariat will find itself forced 
to go even further, to concentrate increasingly in the hands of the state, all capital, all agriculture, all transport, all trade. All the foregoing measures are directed to this end, and they will become practicable and feasible, capable of producing their centralizing effects to precisely the degree that the proletariat, through its labor, multiplies the country's productive forces. So, yeah, putting everything into the hands of the state, which I'm, I'm just going to keep hammering on it because it's important, but ideally is controlled uh, directly or indirectly by the workers themselves. But putting all of that, trying to, to basically pool all of our collective power and all of our collective resources into a government that then distributes things equitably among all of us and and also uses that centralized power to defend our new nation um, against anyone who would who would try and oppose us I, I, that, that's the that's the the general um, advertisement for for communism that's that's what they they want you to to believe in is, is the idea that we have the best chance of sur surviving a revolution and coming out the other side with with these sorts of promises being able to be upheld not just in, in for a year or two but but you know into perpetuity if we pull all of the power together in in a way that that we can fight anyone who would who would seek to to topple uh, what we've put together um, so I, I can definitely see the the appeal of it uh, myself, I, I tend to uh, believe more on the anarchist side. I, I personally, I'm always suspect of any sort of concentration of power. Because especially if you're talking about in, in a revolution, uh, like, like a, a quick, you know, uh, literal overthrow of, of a government, there's always, a, there's always this, this critical time where there's a power vacuum. And, and, you know, hopefully the right people get in place where, where this, this new society can be, be set up and, and fulfilled. But with that concentration of power, if the wrong people get in the wrong places, my, my, my general feeling is that they could just continue trying to amass power for their own ends. They could use justifications of, of you know, defending the, the new nation to carry out their own will. Um, but you know, over time, it could kind of lapse back into a centralized, uh, a centralized uh, power vacuum, or no, power, not power vacuum, like like a, a centralized uh, power. We'll just say power that is, in some ways, still separate from the people themselves, right? From the workers themselves. Um, even though the idea is, in theory, to to uphold workers' rights and 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 make them in charge of their own destiny, I'm always just nervous about that that idea of putting all the power into to one centralized place. My my thought is it's a little bit more. Um, you have a little more security to, to put your eggs in multiple baskets, so to speak, to spread out that power among all the people, and and as Kropotkin talks about just investing the revolution, the fulfillment of the revolution in all of the revolutionaries, uh, trusting them to each wield their own little bit of power uh, overall justly um, and through their new empowerment have good reason to defend it against anyone that, that might come in just uh, from, from within, you know, former capitalists that are trying to regain power or, or invading armies or whatever, what have you. Just the idea of liberating people will make them want to hold on to that liberation. So I tend more to that towards that side, but I definitely see the appeal of wanting a strong central power to make these sorts of changes, especially with such sweeping changes. Um, transformation transformation of the entire economy is is no small thing. All right. So Scrub Lord, sarcastically, I'm assuming, says the USSR and Eastern Europe worked out so well. Well, I mean. By many metrics, it did. Um, they were some of the first to have LGBTQ rights, and and although those eventually were eroded by the likes of Stalin, 
they still had a lot of progress at the beginning. Um, they, they more or less did have a lot of equality among the people. You know, North Korea, I mean, it's very easy to just look at um, experiments in, in socialism that, that may have gone better or worse and say, uh, or, or may have gone worse than ideal and say, well, oh, I mean, that proves that it, it doesn't work out. But I mean, you look at our own system now, and in many ways, it's it's you know no better. In many ways, it's worse. Uh, in the U.S., we don't have health care for everybody. You literally can die if you have an unexpected injury, and even if even if you do have insurance, it could be a death sentence. Um, that doesn't happen in Cuba. That that doesn't happen in Vietnam. I mean, that doesn't happen in, in most of the other Western countries as well, but, but still, there are pretty good examples of terrible policies in Western countries, too. Um, there's all the imperialism that, that, that props up these Western countries. It's, it's not just a, a cut-and-dry thing. Where is the USR, SSR and Kami Europe now? Uh, well, I mean, they did follow, you know, the USSR did dissolve. It fell apart. Um, and it had a lot of, of failings, but it had a lot of successes as well. There's, it, you can't just judge it all by one thing or another. You know, and you know what? Eventually, every country falls. There's, there's no country that lasts forever. Uh, the U.S. is only a couple hundred years old, coming up on maybe, you know, coming up on 250, but, but still. No country is forever. Lines change. Uh, empires fall. So just the idea that, that because it fell apart shows that it was a complete failure, that, that doesn't necessarily hold true. There's definitely still lessons that you can take about uh, the, the triumphs and failures of places like the USSR. Um, I mean, look at the other direction. Vietnam held together, even in, in with the, the biggest military power in the world coming at them. It, it, it managed to resist Western imperialist forces. So, same thing with Cuba. They, they, these places haven't fallen apart. So, I mean, you're, you're trying to oversimplify the thing. It, it's not all just one example or another, and that's it for an entire broad range of theories about how the world can be better, and more equitable, and, and how people can have more freedom in their life. Yeah, Cuba protests, thousands rally against government as economy struggles. <laughs> Do you really want to compare protests? Because the U.S. had the largest protest movement in world history last year after George Floyd was executed. Does that mean that we should dissolve as a country? You know, and, and you know, you take all the, the um, solidarity rallies around the world, and it, and it definitely was the, the largest mass movement in world history. Maybe that is a good reason to dissolve the U.S., but, but just saying that having the presence of detractors within your country who are, you know, fed up enough to be vocal about it means your country should fall, that's, that's a pretty weak standard. That happens in literally every country. There is no country where there are no protests. Um, even in places where protests can get you shot, people still do it and get shot, but, but still, it happens. So that, that's a poor standard, I would say. Oh, and the, uh, we're just going to go through all the, the really tired old um, neoliberal talking points of if the West is so bad, why are so many people trying to get into the West and not Cuba or other commie countries? A big reason is U.S. imperialism that has destabilized these countries that they are fleeing from, that has installed right-wing dictators that employ tactics such as death squads, right-wing death squads that go around and kill any sort of leftist. That's a big reason that people are trying to get out of those countries, because the U.S. has a terrible record of meddling in other countries' uh, politics and installing right-wing dictators. Uh, Pinochet comes to mind. Uh, the, the, uh, the puppet government of Iran. Uh, we propped up Saddam Hussein until we turned against him. 
time and time again, we do these things that, that destabilize and, and completely obliterate these countries. And then we wonder why people want to get out of them. That's why. Because of the U.S. More than likely, it's because of the U.S. Why do people want to come here if we're so bad? So, yeah, again, there's no homelessness in Cuba. That's one, that's one thing that the Cubans do better than the U.S. They may not have as open of a society. They may not have as, as generous of free speech laws. Um, you may not have the ability to, to uh, question the government as much as in the U.S. But, I mean, clearly you still can because there were still protests. And even though the cops were dicks to those protesters, too, they were no worse than the way that the U.S. Uh, various police forces deal with protests here. So, so yeah. Um, it's, it's not just a difference of opinion. It's that you really want to believe something. Scrub Lord, 1963. It's you, you really want to believe that the West and the U.S. Is, is the best of all possible worlds. But, I mean, surely you must think there's a way for it to be better, right? There, there must be some things about this country you don't like that you'd like to see change. There's a lot of things I'd like to see change about this country, too. And there's a lot of things that are not so bad. Um, for all the flaws of the court systems, we, we still have some semblance of rule of law. There's, there's definitely disparities in justice, especially for minorities, but, but justice is still possible to a certain degree. Um, we have an education system where at least the vast majority of people are literate. Uh, there, there, are, there are things to, to like about the U.S. At the local level, people tend to have uh, a fair amount of democratic power, even when it just comes to things like electoralism. Uh, but also things like, like, like protests can, can change cities very quickly. That's something to admire about the U.S. It's not that it's a, a hellhole and that we need to completely remake every single aspect of it. It's, it's that here are some ideas that, that might make it even better, you know? That's where I'm coming from. The Berlin Wall, yes, of course. And you, you can just trot out these examples again and again, but for every Berlin Wall, there's, there's a, the U.S. And, and the U.K. and other... Western powers uh, destabilizing a democratically elected government. Um, there's invasion of countries that, that had nothing to do with the, the things that we are supposedly invading them for, such as Iraq. Nothing to do with 9-11, nothing to do with, with any sort of terrorist attacks on U.S. soil, and yet we went out of our way to invade a sovereign nation, take it over, destabilize it, which then led to the creation of ISIS and, and just made it a whole lot worse, okay? So just because some things have happened that, that you know, things like the Berlin Wall falling have happened, that doesn't mean that the, the alternative is necessarily right or good. Communism is not in the dustbin of history, okay? I mean, e either you believe that countries like Cuba and Vietnam are communist, and, and in, in which case it's obviously still going, or you don't agree that it's communist, in, in which case we should maybe try and get to communism at some point. But, but just, just saying that phrase is not really an argument. You're not, you're not backing it up, just saying it's in the dustbin of history. You know capitalism is an older theory than communism. It, 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 you know Most people pin it to the likes of Adam Smith when it came out long before uh, Marx was even born. So you could say capitalism has been tried, and it was tried time and time and time again. It had to constantly assert itself against the old monarchical powers of, of, the, of its day when it was first, you know, coming into the world as, as, a, as a significant power. And it failed again and again. It was, it was put down by kings, and lords again and again and again until it wasn't, you know. There's there's no end to history. We don't get to some end state point where where things are as good as they'll ever be, and we can never dream of a better world. I certainly hope not for capitalism because it's a, a system that structurally keeps 
the bulk of people down for the benefit of, of the few. It is a, a pyramidal system, just, just by nature. To, to make money as a capitalist, you have to have workers that you then skim the profits off for yourself. You know, to be a capitalist is, is to just own the means of production. You don't actually have to work as a capitalist. You can just sit back and collect the, the money from the efforts of your workers. There's nothing legally stopping you from doing that. Um, but even if you are also a worker, you're never working, you're never yourself producing all the goods of your company, um, at least once you get beyond a, a sole proprietorship sized business, right? To make a million dollars, to make a billion dollars, you have to have a lot of little pots that you can draw from, those pots being the, the value generated by your workers. So to me, that's not a great system if it relies on exploitation of people that just through lottery of birth found themselves in, in not as, as advantaged positions. But there's a lot of back and forth. I'm not going to be able to address every single comment here. Um, so sorry for that, but it's just going too fast for me to, to catch up with, especially when I, when I give more long-winded answers. Uh, but anyway, so Stern says, is it, is it, is it Stern or Stern? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not remembering. But, but Sam, anyway, says, the U.S. has plundered the whole world and left most places in shambles. Absolutely true. Just because you're not seeing it, you're just seeing the, the, the product of it, which is like, you know, affordable electronics, uh, affordable other consumer goods, just because you're only seeing the product of it doesn't mean that those things don't come at a, at the on the backs, literally, of other people at, at the cost of the well-being and the thriving of other people, because they definitely do. There's a reason that, that a lot of uh, factories that manufacture U.S. products have, uh, you know, overseas, I'm talking about, especially in Southeast Asia, have suicide nets on the outside. I'm sorry, sorry, probably not even supposed to mention that word on Twitch, but there it is. They have a net to catch people who, who are trying to, to um, end it all because the, the conditions are so bad in those, those factories. That is, that is part of the, the give and take that you get to have lower cost consumer goods. Um, so just because you're not seeing the damage doesn't mean it's not happening. That's important to keep in mind. If I could leave the USA, where would I go? Uh, where's my favorite commie country? Okay, uh, probably important to mention again that, that I myself, uh, I, I consider myself more of an anarchist than a communist. If I were to go anywhere, it would probably be uh, to join the, the Zapatista movement in Mexico. It seems like they have a much more horizontally organized uh, society there. They're, they're more than an autonomous zone, they're more of an autonomous region. They're, they're a confederation of villages in, in Mexico uh, who do things much more democratically when it comes to, to governance, um, and they provide for people the basics of, of life. So I would go maybe there. Um, I would say Rojava, although it, it is uh, very dangerous in, in um, the Syria part of uh, the Syrian part of the world right now. So, so perhaps not that, but they themselves have also adopted a form of democratic confederalism, much more horizontally, um, powers is, is spread out more horizontally rather than vertically. So I would, I would prefer those sorts of places. Uh, I don't want to leave my children behind though. And, and you know what, they don't, they don't live with me. So that's just one of the realities of my life, uh, that, that I'm pretty much tied to this place. But, but, but this idea that if you don't love it, you should leave it is just stupid. Because I guarantee you, for one, that there, there are things about this country that you abhor. You know, do, do you like everything about it? Uh, I bet it wouldn't take too much probing to, to figure out one aspect of it that you absolutely hate. Um, should you just go somewhere else then? Is, is, is that the only answer when you don't like any part of the country you live in is just leave and go find some place that, that better fits your values? I mean, also, I don't make enough money that I could really relocate anywhere. You know, I, I, 
don't have much of a savings to speak of. Um, you know, I make enough money to live fairly comfortably in this country, but but I, I it, it takes money to to just pick up and move to another country. So so there's that obstacle as well. It's not something you can just do. Um, some people do it out of desperation, and perhaps someday this country will get to the point where where I will be in that spot. But for now, I I am good enough that that I would rather stay here and try to make things better where I'm at. I assume there are things you would like to make better about this country too. So we're probably in agreement that the country's not exactly where it should be in either of our minds, but we would like to help change it, right? So the idea that if you don't love it, leave it doesn't make any sense to me. But I hope that answers your question anyway. Ah, uh, favorite commie country. Okay. Have fun with your two beers. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been talking to you, Scrub Lord. I've given you a lot of, of, of airtime here to answer your questions as best as I can. It's not a monologue if I'm answering your questions. And, and like I said before, I can't get to every single one as you're posting them. You're, you're obviously just throwing out a whole bunch of, of shit and seeing what sticks to the wall so that you can make an argument out of it. And every time I counter it with something, you just move on to the next one. And it's, it's a common tactic of people that don't really know what they believe in, don't really have a lot of basis for, for believing what they do, uh, haven't really explored any sort of alternative worldview or ideas. Uh, so they just parrot things that they've heard. And, oh, well, that one didn't work. We'll just throw out another one. Oh, that one didn't work. Let's throw out another one. The, the, there's no dialogue in that either, right? You're just trying to to silence me into, well, I just can't answer that question, or you're right, uh, you know, your worldview is 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 the correct one, obviously, because I can't answer which commie country I would move to, right? That that that's basically the the tactics, right? Because you don't really have much of anything else backing you up, so. And if you want to go somewhere else, like I'm not, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to beg for you to 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 stay in this chat. Um, you give me some good things to jump off on, some some good points that that I can throw out there. But uh, other than that, there's there's absolutely no. You're right. There's no back and forth here because I answer your question and you just ask a different question. So there you have it. Yeah, there's definitely blood on our hands. Uh, Strin, Sam. I, I guess I should just say Sam. Sorry, I keep switching back and forth there. Uh, <laughs> Nightbot. Maybe I need to tone down Nightbot just a little bit. It's supposed to come every 10 minutes, but whatever. Yeah, without a one-sentence answer, they think they've won, but things aren't that simple. Yeah, right. It takes time for me to lay out my ideas because I've, I've done a little bit of, of study of theory myself. Obviously, that's, that's one reason I, I do this channel. And I've just thought myself about what I believe in. I have more nuanced ideas than just can fit on a bumper sticker necessarily. Um, you know, I can try to get things down to, to pithy one-liners, but, you know, it, it doesn't always come that way. Um, stick with Strin? Okay. And, I, and I'm pronouncing that right. Strin, right? Anyway. Let's let's move on in the in the in the book now that uh, I think I've answered as many questions as as I'm going to be able to uh, from that part. So let, let's keep going. Finally, when all capital, all production, all exchange have been brought together in the hands of the nation, private property will disappear of its own accord. Money will become superfluous, and production will so expand and man so change that society will be able to Absolutely slough true. off whatever of its old economic habits may remain. 19. Will it be possible for this revolution to take place in one country alone? No. By creating the world market, big industry has already brought all the peoples of the earth, and especially the civilized peoples, into such close relation with one another that none is independent of what happens to the others. Further, it has coordinated the social development of the civilized countries to such an extent that, in all of them, bourgeoisie and proletariat have become the decisive classes, and the struggle between them the great struggle of the day. It follows that the communist revolution will... And for a while in the U.S., there was 
more of a, a middle class, people that, that were fairly well off, that, that had all the necess necessities of their life, that more or less had uh, a lot of opportunity open to them to, to decide the fate of their own lives uh, that was brought about, uh, we should remember, by, by the likes of anarchists that, that fought for things like the 40-hour the work week uh, and, um, you know, the 8-hour the work day, these sorts of things. Uh, the, the, the original New Deal was, in fact, a, a, a compromise, a, a neoliberal, not, I guess it was still a, a neoliberal compromise, uh, where we didn't quite get past com or didn't get past capitalism, so instead they made a whole bunch of concessions about uh, guaranteed jobs and, and um, stuff like that. But for a while we did have a, a, a substantial middle class. Like you didn't have to have more than a high school diploma, and you could walk into any factory and get a decent job that you could support your entire family on. Little by little, that that neoliberal hand has has clawed away. Uh, that sort of power, where unions have been diminished substantially. I think it's less than 10% of U.S. workers are in a union now. It used to be much higher than that. And in countries such as Sweden, it's more like the, the flip side. It's, it's closer to like 90% of, of workers are within unions. Um, but I mean, keep in mind, though, that's still within capitalism. But, but anyway, the point being, we had a time where we had a, a substantial middle class, but that has been eroding generation after generation to the point where, I mean, we're getting towards some sort of a breaking point. It, it, there has to be the, either a great compromise again, or we're going to be, or there's going to be people pushing for a completely different system because uh, generation, uh, the, the millennial generation has a very small fraction of, of what uh, the, the preceding, preceding, yeah, preceding generations had in terms of, of wealth that they've captured. So you look back at Gen Z or Gen X at at, uh, at forty years old, they they captured a much higher percentage of the economy. And you look at the Boomers, they they had more or less a quarter of the economy captured by the time that they were forty, and that's been diminishing generation after generation. By the time Gen Z gets up to uh, start entering its 40s, it's going to be a very minuscule portion of, of global wealth capture, um, if we even get to that point before capitalism completely just falls apart. But something's got to give. Uh, the, the, the tension between um, the disparity in compensation just keeps getting wider, or keep, keeps getting tighter and tighter as, as, as uh, the uber wealthy continue to pull away um, from from the the working class it the system can't really hold itself together and, and and it's it's this neoliberal experiment has to either be reset by another sort of new deal compromise or it's going to fall past capitalism completely we'll just try something different and hopefully we don't go for the the fearful option uh, that, that the likes of Trump and his fascist supporters would uh, like to see. Hopefully we go in the other direction, but, but we have to keep pushing for these sorts of leftist ideas if we're going to ever want to steer um, any sort of opportunity for change. I would love to be in a union as well, perennial green. That would be phenomenal. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I make a, a halfway decent wage, um, and uh, pretty soon I'm going to be getting promoted even even higher, and I'll probably make a pretty comfortable wage, perhaps even a salary for the first time in my life. But but still, a union would be great. And even if I get to the point where I have a lot of people working underneath me, I would definitely want them to be able to, to join a union. I want them to have protections. I don't want my work to just, you know, exploit everything that they can, squeeze every drop of their effort out for themselves. Especially, like, my field landscaping is very physically demanding it's it's not something that just anyone can do you have i mean it, it there's nothing inherent about the you know there's nothing essentialist i'm trying to say about that but you have to have a certain level of physical fitness to be able to perform the stuff because it, it really wears on your body and 
frankly, the, the, the lowest workers in my field should be compensated a lot better for the, the amazing work that they do and the hard, constant work that they do. Um, so I would never try and slam the door behind myself, even if I got into a, a higher position. And, and I would hope that, that if you care about leftist ideas, you would feel the same way, especially if you ever decided to start your own business. Hopefully it would be something that would be non-exploitative to begin with, something where workers have more buy-in, more democratic say in, in the goings-on and, and the, the structure, and especially where the profit goes in the business that they contribute so much time and effort towards. Yeah, uh, you say, uh, Strin, that your, your dad was an immigrant and raised a family of five on a factory job. That is unheard of these days. I see those factory jobs out there. I used to work for FedEx, which, you know, had a, it wasn't necessarily a factory, but it had a lot of the same aspects of a a factory. There was a lot of heavy lifting of boxes. Things came on conveyor belts. It was, it was very similar work to factory work, a lot of repetition, so on and so forth. Starting wage for those jobs was $17 an hour. And besides that, you had to work overnights. So you would come in at two, three in the morning to start sorting boxes onto trucks and these boxes could be up to 150 pounds i believe that was our cutoff for the heaviest boxes was 150 pounds average box was was more like 10 to 20 pounds but still putting 200 300 boxes on a single truck and then going to another truck and another truck and another truck you, you can imagine how much that could wear out a person's muscles doing those motions again and again and again 17 dollars an hour overnight that's what they were wanting to to compensate no benefits no sort of union representation, no job guarantee, nothing. You, you were, you're, you know, if you get injured, you, you would probably have to struggle very hard even to get workers' compensation. Um, but you definitely didn't have any health care. So if you, you were just out sick, you're out money. Uh, yeah, things have changed quite a bit since even the time when, when unions were strong and robust. Uh, so young mogul 16, this is why communism is bad because people talk about it on Twitch. Not really sure where you're going with that. But feel free to elaborate. Like why 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 communism bad? Tell me. Tell me please. And and what would you prefer instead? I'd love to know. Let's continue on in the book though. Will not merely be a national phenomenon, but must take place simultaneously in all civilized countries. That is to say, at least in England, America, France and Germany. It will develop in each of these countries more or less rapidly, according as one country or the other has a more developed industry, greater wealth, a more significant mass of productive forces. Hence, it will go slowest and will meet most obstacles in Germany, most rapidly and with the fewest difficulties in England. It will have a productive impact on the other countries of the world and will radically alter the course of development, which they have followed up to now, while greatly stepping up its pace. It is a... History almost went that way. You know, you know the, the Labour Party, one of the, the two dominant parties in the UK, which he's just referring to as England, but aside from the point, I don't even know if there was a United Kingdom back in his day. I, I don't know the history that, that precisely, but that's not the point. Uh, the Labour Party that, that is in England, um, or the UK, I should say, uh, present-day UK, used to really stand for Labour. Like, they were all about buffing up unions to the point where eventually socialism could be like, like not democratic socialism or, or not not social democracy not not anything of the scandinavian variety but literal socialism could then take over their idea was to push through socialism through by, by democratic means basically by just voting in the right people that eventually would make the changes needed to to uh push socialism and it almost happened uh, they've swung back towards that direction recently with, with the likes of Jeremy Corbyn. But it's, it's, it's critical to understand just how close we've come several times to breaking in a different direction by taking a hard left and actually trying something that uplifts people en masse, uh, uplifts the worker, provides for them the basic necessities of their life, and, and most importantly, perhaps, gives them greater control over the thing that they pour most of their time and their brain into uh, and, and effort into every day 
their workplace, their, whatever job that they're doing. Um, we've come close several times to that in, in the so-called Western world. It just hasn't quite gotten all that way. There's been a compromise that's come into place. There's been a war or a catastrophe that, that's, that's just made it not break in that quite, quite in that direction. But the point being that capitalism is not just inevitable. It's not eternal. Uh, there's, there's a quote I like from, um, oh, now I'm going to blank on her name. Uh, you know what? I'm not even going to try on that, that, that quote right now. But, but it's to the effect of capitalism seems inevitable. It seems eternal. But so did the divine right of kings, you know, for for over a thousand years, like basically from the beginning of, of civilization, there were kings and kingdoms um, and queens, too. I'm just using it as a broader term. There was monarchies, and that was the dominant form for over a thousand years uh, for, you know, you go back to to ancient Egypt, uh, four thousand years, four and a half thousand years. We, we've had monarchies. Living in a system like that, it definitely, too, would seem eternal. But it, too, ended up crumbling and falling. New stuff came. It happened to be capitalism, but it doesn't mean we can't just continue on changing our form of government, our form of economics, um, our form of social life, you know. Nothing is, is eternal. Nothing is inevitable just because the, the, the people that, that benefit most from it like to prop up those sorts of ideas and tell those sorts of narratives about it. Oh, it became the UK in 1801, so there you go. Um, it still was the UK in, in Engel's time. I don't know why he's just talking about it as England, especially since I'm pretty sure Engel's was from the UK. But beside the point, that's just a, a minor point. It has nothing to do with the theory that's being talked about now. Let's... Uh, Let's get, oh, we live in capitals. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the uh, Ursula K. Le Guin. I don't know why that name wouldn't come out of my mouth, but yes, let's get the, the full proper quote because it's a, it's a great one. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inevitable or inescapable. Excuse me. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be res resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often being an art and very often our art, uh, the art of words. Oh, excuse me. I think I probably messed that up there. Resistance and change often begin in art. There we go. And very often in our art, the art of words. Ursula K. Le Guin. Here we go. We can be at the beginning of something here. Just by, by talking about these ideas, even if we end up rejecting them entirely, at the end of the day, we've at least considered something different. And I think that's important, an important first step to change. Um, and another for, another step to change uh, could be, if you haven't done so already, to to follow this this Twitch channel, and to check out my links uh, at the various places. You know, just watch for that that uh, Nightbot showing up. It'll I, I have a link tree that it periodically shouts out, and um, yeah, I, I put this out as a a podcast. I put this out as a YouTube channel. As well, I do an edited version of the live streams. Um, so yeah, and if you're new to this here too, I do this theory stream every Friday night at, at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, to 9, 10 o'clock, depends on, on how much I end up chatting. Um, and we go through various uh, leftist theory uh, audiobooks. I may get to the point someday where I'm having to, where I decide instead to read the books myself. That might be a fun change. I might, I might experiment with that maybe in the next book that we do. So I'll read it to you in my own voice, of course, uh, rather than listening to an audio book. But I, I go back and forth between, I try to do a communist one, then an anarchist perspective, back and forth. Um, could be just generic socialism as well. But we're trying to get a whole range of ideas from the, the left side of political theory. So I do that every Friday. And then also on Sundays, I, I put out a stream that can be whatever. I've been doing permaculture, um, introduction to permaculture a lot recently. Had uh, Dan Platt, the Three Lefts podcast on, uh, recently talking about uh, new urbanism. We went over some fun videos in that. Sometimes I just dunk on right-wingers. I do a, a, 
a variety of stuff. And that's always Sundays, usually around the same time, usually ends up being around 7 p.m. standard or central standard time, I should say. But it could be any time during the day. Um, but it's always Sundays. So, yeah. And, and if you haven't done so yet, please give me a follow. That, that really helps uh, boost my, my standing in the algorithm and all that, that good stuff. And I thank you all for, for sticking with me tonight, too. Um, I've, I've been trying to watch the, the viewers in chat, and it's, it's definitely been over three for, for most of the time. So if you don't know, I'm just on the cusp of, of making affiliate for Twitch, and I have to have an, the, the, the last criteria that I have to meet is to have an average of three viewers per stream. I've met all the other stuff. I just have to have at least three people watching for the most, uh, for, for, for um, you know, across each stream. Um, so pretty close here. And then I can get to things, I can start doing things like uh, having actual subscribers. We can start developing our own emotes. A lot of fun stuff can happen once once I finally get to that affiliate point. So I thank you very much for, for joining me in this journey and, and helping me out with that. It means a lot that 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 you all watch and, and uh, chat and, and, and listen in and all that sort of good stuff. So so thank you. So uh, hello to Rocket Wayne as well. And, and they say in Star Trek, the United Federation of Planets was largely socialist. I, I would agree that that definitely is a, a version of socialism. Um, they had free health care. Yep. There's, they've had no money, essentially. They were a moneyless society because there was no limit to resources through things like the replicator. They could just make whatever they want. So they had free, free food, free housing, all this sort of stuff, education. People worked on themselves and bettering themselves as a person. And if you notice, everyone still worked. There, there were not a whole bunch of layabouts that, that did nothing and, and just, you know, mooched off the system, as so often is the charge from capitalists, that, that um, socialism would bring in that sort of society where everyone just depends on a few people to work and, and uh, the majority of people don't. I think that's too dim a, a, a view of people. People inherently want to be useful. They want to feel uh, appreciated, and they want to feel like they're doing good work. Uh, that, that's my perspective on it. And because of those things, they're just naturally going to do something, you know. Um, they're going to do some work that, that, that helps out the rest of their community. What, whatever they're able to do, whatever they have the time and the energy and the, the, the will to do. Um, so I think that's, that's a silly thing to be worried about and not really borne out in, you know, if you actually look into it at all. Oh, thank you so much for, for uh, saying that I'm doing good work. That's really nice. So there you go. That's, that's the link tree that the Nightbot has just um, uh, shouted out in the chat. So you can follow me on all the, the different platforms at l-a-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory. Um, so you can, yeah, get all my YouTube stuff. You can get links to the, the various Facebook groups that I run. Um, I'll give you a, a quick look at that, and then we'll get back into the book right after that. So here's my, my link tree. Twitch, YouTube, podcast, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can buy my art and help support me that way. I do nature photography and put it on a bunch of different products, or at least a company does for me, and then I get a very small cut of that. Um, I have the Left Signal Boost database, which has listings. It's, it's a crowdsourced database of, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of leftist creators across all sorts of different platforms, not only Twitch, but YouTube, podcasts, um, pretty much any sort of social media or, or place that you could in, ingest media, there's a listing for it. And you can add your own as well. Uh, I run Left Pod Posting, which helps promote leftist podcast creators, as well as Left Signal Boost. Those are both on Facebook. And I, I've tried to cultivate communities that, that uh, you know, we mutual aid each other. For you know, I mean, That's basically what it is. We, we help boost each other's reach and, and get good leftist ideas and, and projects and, and creations out to more people. And then you can also friend me on Goodreads, see what I'm, I'm reading just in my everyday life. I, I, I'm trying to do 52 books this year, but I'm, I'm, I'm like 18 books behind at this point. But I've done a fair amount. Um, the last book that I read was, uh, it was actually ended up being a really good one. Uh, it was a, a speculative fiction book 
It was called The Fifth Sacred Thing. It was, it was by Starhawk. And as you may uh, surmise from the title, it did have a fair amount of like New Ages sort of, of woo thrown into it. Uh, but it never felt forced. It never felt like, you know, I really got to get this, this New Age concept in there. So I'm just going to shoehorn in shoehorn it in it felt like it felt like a, a possible society that she was describing and the 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 book is set mostly in um future san francisco around 2050 uh climate change has has ravaged the the environment so water is very scarce in california um the 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 ocean and the, and the bays are, are very much toxic and uh, you have a society that is a, a leftist society. It's, it's, it's pretty much an anarchist uh, form of organization known as is coerced to work. Uh, they, they still have some forms of currency in the, in the form of work credits, but you were given a certain amount of work. You basically get a UBI of work credits that you were able to spend on whatever you feel like. All right. Uh, I guess Bitfire got timed out there for a second. Um, anyway. Uh, so it, it, it just seems like a pretty cool anarchist society. And, and what they're dealing with is the incoming or the, the, the forthcoming invasion from the, the last vest, vestiges of the old capitalist imperialist regime that's coming up from the south and, and trying to take them over and basically steal all their water and, uh, and that sort of thing. You know, I, I don't actually know why, why Nightbot flagged you for that. Spitfire 3666. Um, I know I, I can't really see from my end what you tried to do. So sorry about that. Um, use the question mark. Well, perhaps there was some sort of a command that um, it flagged it in Nightbot. So I apologize for that. No idea. I, I didn't program it to do that. So it must just be something that it naturally does. Um, anyway, fifth sacred thing seems like a, a really cool vision of society organized around anarchist principles that that also has a lot of, you know, respect towards people's various ancestors and backgrounds. Uh, it, it basically is done away with with all class differences. Everyone has enough uh, to live their lives. No one hoards things. There's no rich people. And, and that's set in contrast from the old capitalist society where any number of, of really terrible things goes on. And basically, people are, for the most part, reduced to um, low-level workers, laborers for their society. They have no control over their lives. Uh, they often get conscripted into the army. Um, it's it's. It's a pretty good definition of, of a capitalist hellscape, really. But anyway, highly recommend that fifth sacred thing uh, by Starhawk. But let, let's get back to the book and, and learn more about a communist society. Universal revolution and will, accordingly, have a universal range. 20. What will be the consequences of the ultimate disappearance of private property? Society will take all forces of production and means of commerce, as well as the exchange and distribution of products, out of the hands of private capitalists, and will manage them in accordance with a plan based on the availability of resources and the needs of the whole society. In this way, most... So we're, we're, we're moving more towards a need-based economy. And if you remember back, if you've been, uh, if you've looked at the, uh, when we went through the conquest of bread... That's, that's also what Kropotkin was talking about in his vision of an anarcho-communist society, which today would, would be more thought of as an anarchist society, a needs-based economy. We would calculate what the need for the, the people is in, in terms of food or, or shelter or whatever, and we would set about producing that every year, just collectively. Um, in Kropotkin's uh, formulation of it, people would just give out products and, and services, and in return would take whatever they need. Um, things would just be freely given, mutual aided to each other, uh, and that's how the economy would flow. Uh, would, would flow. In this conception, you would have a centralized planning uh, structure, apparatus, that itself would, would plan for the needs of, of the people, and it would base production around needs rather than profit or you know 
market manipulation in another country. You wouldn't be producing things to then dump in a market so you could, uh, you know, drive down the cost of, of a particular commodity and, and put the local farmers out of business. That sort of thing wouldn't be done. Uh, oh, oh the, the Zionist theory, which demands a Jewish state. Well, um, maybe at the end of this, we, we could get on that a little more. I, I really want to get through this book, though, and um, I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time talking about tangential issues. We probably could talk about something like that really quickly. I, I, I don't think that theocracies are a good way of doing things in general. I, having said that, of course, people's religions should definitely be respected, and as much as possible, people should be allowed to live their lives how they see fit, as, as long as they are not infringing on other people's rights. I don't see a problem with it. But, but to have a state run by a particular religion, no matter how benevolent or, or, or even if there was a religion based around uh, anarchy or communism, uh, the idea of mixing religion and, and state together I don't think is is a good idea. I think it leads to there being favored and and lower classes. Um, so so no, I, I think it would lead to bad. I think it leads in general to bad hierarchies that I that I don't like. Um, so yeah, we'll just leave it at that for now, and and we'll move on in the book. Most important of all, the evil consequences which are now associated with the conduct of big industry will be abolished. There will be no more crises. The expanded production, which for the present order of society is overproduction and hence a prevailing cause of misery, will then be... He's talking about the the boom-bust cycles, which still pretty much adheres to the seven-year rule in in capitalism. You have a recession. You have a bust in the economy. Um, He's talking about smoothing all of that out because you're never going to ramp up things so quickly and, and, and overabundantly that you end up destroying your own market, right? You're, you're only producing based on projected needs. So so things tend to be a little bit, or a lot bit more smoother uh, in terms of economic swings. You don't necessarily get the, the, the you know, high flying highs, but at the same time, you don't get those busts where a whole lot of people go out of business at once. A whole lot of people end up jobless all at once. Um, it's, it's more of an even keeled ride. Um, based on needs rather than than profit. Insufficient and in need of being expanded much further. Instead of generating misery, overproduction will reach beyond the elementary requirements of society to assure the satisfaction of the needs of all. It will create new needs and at the same time the means of satisfying them. It will become the condition of and the stimulus to. So as as I understand that, it's creating new needs just by, by technology and the standard of living living, you know, changing, growing, moving forward in places, getting pruned off in other places, just as things normally happen, right? That's how I interpret that, if that helps at all. New progress, which will no longer throw the whole social order into confusion, as progress has always done in the past. Big industry, freed from the pressure of private property, will undergo such an expansion that what we now see will seem as petty in comparison as manufacturer seems when put beside the big industry of our own day. This development of industry will make available to society a sufficient mass of products to satisfy the needs of everyone. The same will be true of agriculture, which also suffers from the pressure of private property and is held back by the division of privately owned land into small parcels. Here, existing improvements and scientific procedures will be put into practice with a resulting leap forward, which will assure to society all the products it needs. Ah, so, so Engels, as, as well as we learned in the, the last chapter of The Conquest of Bread, Kropotkin as well, believe very much in, in the Industrial Revolution's promise of bringing great leaps in, in technology and having those great leaps. Instead of having the, the profit from these leaps forward, mostly enjoyed by the people that own the means of the, the private means of production, the, the owner class, it would instead be enjoyed by the entirety of society because the workers would then own their own means of production, right? But, but they both believed in this, this, this promise of technology leaping forward and advancing things. Now, having all the benefit of, of 170-some years of, of hindsight, 
we can look back and say that technology is not necessarily the way to make agriculture function better. Uh, in fact, with theories such as, as permaculture, we can, we can make the argument that perhaps design has more of a role to play in, in improving yields, improving agricultural resilience, in building back the, the soil loss that, that we still face every year doing conventional agriculture. There's a certain amount of topsoil that just blows away due to things like exposure. When you, when you plow all the crops down at the end of the, the season, say you have a cornfield, you just you till it under the soil, it leaves a lot of bare soil and, and it exposes it to the elements. It compacts it from precipitation, but it also blows away when it dries out. And topsoil, it turns out, is very hard to regenerate, especially if you're just going to do it through natural means. But if you use practices such as permaculture and you design things in a, in a, in a way that's more intentional and, and thinking in the long term, you can start regenerating ecosystems. You can start building facsimiles of ecosystems or, or becoming more a part of the local ecosystem yourself while at the same time increasing yields, um, reducing the amount of, of machinery, farm machinery that you need. Uh, and as things mature and, and start supporting each other, because we've designed things in, in a thoughtful way, as the elements start uh, supporting one another, you do less and less work as, as time goes on. So even though they believe in, 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 in you know, Engel's time and as well as Kropotkin's time, they believed a lot more in the promise of technological advances. I think today our focus should be a lot more on just advances in thinking and design. And, and really, you know, one of the principles is observe and interact. Just, just taking those observations and, and playing around with them with the aim of, of producing a more self-managing, flourishing and and yet still productive for for lack of a better word a system that we can still get a whole lot out of a lot of benefit out of at the same time just from following these these permaculture principles and ethics um real quickly those 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 ethics are care for the earth care for people return the surplus to the service of the first two and also set limits um to to growth you know don't always be looking to uh, capture more and more land and, and put more and more land under the plow. Set limits to to your impact on the earth, basically. So those are the, the, the ethics and then the principles are um, David Holmgren, one of the co-originators, came up with 12 of them. Um, they have things like observe and interact, use small and slow solutions, produce no waste, stuff like that. And I think by using these concepts and uh, folding them in with these, these leftist ideas, I think we can get a product uh, that is better for both, that is better for everybody, you know, better than if we just followed permaculture and tried to steer away from the politics altogether, and also better than if we just looked at absolute numbers production rather than the quality and the, the long-term resilience of the systems that we're creating. A little aside there, but but uh, I think it's important uh, to to consider these ideas as well as, as we look at the ideas that um, are coming up in these books. In this way, such an abundance of goods will be able to satisfy the needs of all its members. The division of society into different, mutually hostile classes will then become unnecessary. Indeed, it will be not only unnecessary, but intolerable in the new social order. The existence of classes originated in the division of labor, and the division of labor, as it has been known up to the present, will completely disappear. For mechanical and chemical processes are not enough to bring industrial and agricultural production up to the level we have described, the capacities of the men who make use of these processes must undergo a corresponding development. Just as the peasants and manufacturing workers of the last century changed their whole way of life and became quite different people when they were drawn into big industry. In the same way, communal control over production by society as a whole 
and the resulting new development will both require an entirely different kind of human material. People will no longer be, as they are today, subordinated to a single branch of production, bound to it, exploited by it. They will no longer develop one of their faculties at the expense of all others. They will no longer... And Kropotkin talked a lot about this too, the, the alienation of the worker from their work. Whereas there used to be more common um, the, the guild form of capitalism, where you would start as an apprentice in a certain trade. Let's just pick uh, blacksmithing. You would work your way up year after year. You would become a journeyman. And eventually the promise is that you would get to become the master of that trade once your master retired. Uh, and then you would get to have people work under you. The system would come up like that. And, and as Kropotkin talked about, and now Engels is talking about as well, the, the form of communism that, or excuse me, the form of capitalism that was becoming predominant because of the Industrial Revolution was greater and greater specialization. So instead of being a blacksmith, maybe now you only make nails. Maybe now you only, you know, uh, produce the equipment for a blacksmith. And, and you never have any hope of owning the factory that you now work for. Uh, so he's talking about pushing that back in, in the opposite direction, where, pe where people can uh, be not just hyper-specialists, but be able to do all the different facets of a particular type of work. Um, and, and Marx talked about this a lot, too, where... Uh, and, and so to Kropotkin, where by by specializing so much, you take a lot of the joy out of the work. Like anyone who's ever worked in, in a really menial job where you do just one or two things again and again and again can tell you that it's it's really crushing. Um, it's hard on your body. It's it's hard on your mind. It's, it's hard on your spirit, really. Um, it just it wears you down because... Uh, you're just being alienated from the the variety of a work that you otherwise could be doing if you weren't so hyper specialized. So he wants to push it back in the other direction and make work something that people can take more pride and more joy in. Again, longer know only one branch or one branch of a single branch of production as a whole. Even industry as it is today is finding such people less and less useful. Industry controlled by society as a whole. Yeah. And that, that continues on till today. Industry finds uh, specialization less and less useful, even as it relies on it more and more. Um, to the point where you're, say, a picker at an Amazon warehouse, and you literally just wander around and, and pick your, your list of items out of boxes or bins and put them into another box. Uh, very low valued jobs by every sense of the term. You don't get paid well. You're not treated well. You're treated to horrific uh, conditions. And yet more and more, that's, that's what companies are relying on. And the, the, the trend continues till today that, that he's talking about. And operated according to a plan presupposes well-rounded human beings, their faculties developed in balanced fashion, able to see the system of production in its entirety. The form of the division of labor, which makes one a peasant, another a cobbler, a third a factory worker, a fourth a stock market operator, has already been undermined by machinery and will completely disappear. Yeah, so that, that, that's what I was just talking about, the old form of, of but, but basically it's just people that, the form of capitalism where you have trades and you have apprentices that eventually become masters transitioning to because of new machinery doing just one thing on a factory line that's what he's talking about education will enable young people quickly to familiarize themselves with the whole system of production and to pass from one branch of production to another in response to the needs of society or their own inclinations it will therefore free them from the one-sided character which the present-day division of labor impresses upon every individual. Communist society will, in this way, make it possible for its members. Boarding. It follows that society organized on a communist basis is incompatible with the existence of classes on the one hand, and that the very building of such a society provides the means of abolishing class differences on the other. 
doing away with the old form of the exploiter class and the exploited class. Whether you're talking about master and slave, uh, lord and serf, <coughs> or even master and apprentice. And then now uh, owner and worker. We're doing away with that entire relationship where one person gets a hugely lopsided benefit from the relationship and the other has very little control over their life and, and their means of subsistence. Uh, communism, as well as anarchism and, and socialism, wipes that all away and it, it, it destroys that, that difference. Uh, there's, there's no difference then between worker and owner. All workers are in part owners of, of the means of production. A corollary of this is that the difference between country and city is destined to disappear. The management of agriculture and industry by the same people, rather than by two different classes of people, is, if only for purely material reasons, a necessary condition of communist association. The dispersal of the agricultural population on the land, alongside the crowding of the industrial population into the great cities, is a condition which corresponds to an undeveloped state of both agriculture and industry, and can already be felt as an obstacle to further development. And, and, and I've heard this, this idea before, and I, I still don't quite grasp what they're getting at. He's saying that, that there becomes then a, a dissolving of the distinction between town and country. Uh, but that just doesn't make sense to me on, on just a materialistic basis. You have to have a lot of people in towns to operate machinery, to do the various services uh, that are required. It, you just have to have a higher concentration of people. Out on the land, you have to have lower concentrations of people. You're devoting more land. I mean, you're literally spacing things out by devoting more land to agriculture. You may have these, these more dense uh, communes that, that would come up, so that, that, in a way, would be changing the, the density of the rural areas. But it'd be more like just concentrating a small farming town all into, you know, one collection of buildings where they all live together. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily even be adding more people. It might if you need more labor, though. But All right. Stay mad, Chud. I like that name. I'm a leftist, but communism won't work. You need some markets and currency to subsidize and decommodify necessities. If you try to decommodify everything, you have no wealth to subsidize anything. Uh, no such thing as a free lunch. Markets and currency are fine when it isn't tied to necessities or, uh, or capital. I think you meant capital rather than capitalists, I'm assuming. That's a fair argument. I think that's definitely a fair argument. Um, what, what, what you're talking more about then is a form of what would be called market socialism, where for the necessities of life, food, housing, water, utilities, communication, transportation, these sorts of things, no one would make a profit uh, from them, at the very least. Even if you're still using money to, to have transactions in these fields, no one's making a profit off that. So no one's you know, being able to exploit another person for them to have the basics of life. Uh, but then for everything else, everything that's considered more of a luxury or something that you could have if, if that's what you so choose, you still have the same sort of markets for that. I, th I think that's what you're getting at, if I'm not mistaken. I think there's a good argument to be made for, for that at least being a transitional form between that and a, and a more moneyless society. And, and as I was mentioning earlier, it, it really is hard to imagine just doing away with, with money entirely. Uh, just, you know, sweeping up every, everything into, uh, to be managed by central powers, you know, managed by the, the, the people themselves, but, but collectively as a centralized power. It's a hard thing to imagine that that would be a, a drastic change to every facet of, of modern life. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that we should go through a period of socialism first where 
like you say, we decommodify the necessities of life. No one is, is, is exploiting someone else for uh, a place to live, meaning there's no more landlords. Everyone is allowed to have uh, a, a primary dwelling. Um, everyone is allowed to have a certain amount of food to live on. Uh, everyone is allowed to have access to education and health care just by being alive and a person. Uh, th there's no point in, in that society where you can be denied any of that stuff just for lack of ability to pay, right? But then everything else functions as normal. I, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's fair. But, but, you know, as, as I try to point out in, in this series of stuff, one reason why we don't just look at anarchy or don't just look at communism is because we're trying to get a, a broad range of views and, and then decide for ourselves what makes most sense. Uh, at least for the next step, for pushing past capitalism. So, yeah. Moving on. The general cooperation of all members of society for the purpose of planned exploitation of the forces of production, the expansion of production to the point where it will satisfy the needs of all. Oh, and, and also, uh, stay mad, Judd. I don't think I've, I've seen you in the chat before, so if you haven't... Uh, Go ahead and give me a follow. Like, uh, if you enjoy this sort of thing, if you enjoy talking about theory, love to to have you as a viewer and and a commenter uh, going forward. So, easiest way to remember to do that is to to give me a follow. The abolition of a situation in which the needs of some are satisfied at the expense of the needs of others, the complete liquidation of classes and their conflicts, the rounded development of the capacities of all members of society through the elimination of the present division of labor through industrial education, through engaging in varying activities, through the participation. So, so th that was an important point that I don't want to be lost uh, with all the things that he's bringing up right now. Uh, through the, He talked about re-education of, of industries. I, I don't think those were his exact words, but that's the gist of it. The idea being that, that just because you work in a particular industry now, you happen to find yourself, um, you know, let, let's say an Amazon uh, warehouse worker. That doesn't mean that just be, because society has changed and, and you now are a part owner of that Amazon warehouse that you have to be locked into that. That may not be your highest calling to, to work in a warehouse, um, to do anything that you're doing right now. You may not, you may be a, a barista at, at a coffee shop and that may not be your ideal job. You would then have access to education being, you know, one of the things that, that is just a right for everyone to have. Uh, to to re-educate yourself into whatever field you then do want to go into. So so l let's let's not assume that just because even like if you're doing something really necessary like farming that you would have to continue being a farming or being a farmer in then a a communist society because that just wouldn't be the case. And yeah, we're talking about liberation of people. You can't really say you're liberating someone if you're locking them into the same track that they're on now, no matter what they want to do themselves, right? ...by all in the enjoyments produced by all, through the combination of city and country, these are the main consequences of the abolition of private property. 21. What will be the influence of communist society on the family? Hmm. It will transfer... This is a very important section that is often really misinterpreted. When he, when he talks about the family it's important to realize that he's just talking about expanding what that concept could be. He doesn't, I, I, I really don't read it as him saying it has to be this way or the other way, just that we can get beyond uh, the acceptable forms and configurations of family right now, of, of you know, the nuclear family or, or even the, the very shortly extended family. We can, we can have different living arrangements. We could have communes where people that are unrelated more or less function as, as a family for one another. They live and they work together, um, that sort of thing. So, so I think the best way to interpret this is the possibilities that could be opened up in a communist society, not that this is the way things would have to go. Form the relations between the sexes into a purely private matter which concerns only the persons involved and into which... The right, so especially in... in this time, marriage was much more an economic transaction. Um, 
it would be more or less the 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 uh, man, and of course just the the man and the woman formation of it, not even a consideration of of any other sort of pairing, but the man would uh, you know in reality be purchasing a wife right purchasing someone to do the housekeeping to bear and raise children uh and and do all those things that that uh are stereotypically assigned as women's work and then the man would then go out into the world and and make a living um and that would be his role and there's no other possibility. You have to do that. It's it's basically an economic arrangement where you're purchasing an in-home maid and, and nanny and, and uh, child uh, or educator. Um, and in return, you give them, instead of money, you know, food, um, shelter, clothing, all the, all the necessities of their life, right? So it's very transactional, uh, especially in, in his time. So he's talking about breaking apart from that, not just being this this cold economic thing, um, expanding it into other possibilities. Society has no occasion to intervene. It can do this since it does away with private property and educates children on a communal basis, and in this way removes the two bases of traditional marriage, the dependence rooted in private property, of the woman on the man, and of the children on the parents. Right. So so no longer do women have to get married in order to make it in the world. They can choose to work uh, in, in, in any sort of field, including the, the caring fields, which we have now developed a lot more since that time. Things like child care, care for the, the disabled um, or people with, with different needs, uh, special needs, um, care for the elderly, these sorts of positions that aren't you know and, and as well as education these positions that well they they you know in terms of what society says may be revered and and uh, held up as a necessary good thing when it comes to compensation it's it's really not the case it's it's one of the the biggest problems when it comes to the wage gap between men and women it's not just that men tend to get paid more for um, for a particular job, like, like say, uh, uh, you know, a restaurant manager. It's not just that, that they would tend to get paid more than if it was a female, uh, a, a, a woman restaurant manager. It's also that the, the types of jobs that men and women tend to get funneled into whether they're pushed by, by colleagues or professors or, or teachers or their parents or whatever to do one thing or another, the ones that, that men tend to get tend to be compensated a lot better than the ones that women tend to get. So we can all agree that we need to have people taking care of the elderly, the people that, that can't really take care of themselves anymore. Uh, we agree that's completely essential work. We can, we can agree that education is completely essential work. That we can't have a society without education. But at the same time, we compensate those people that work in those fields a whole lot less. So he's talking about um, doing away with all of that because eventually we're doing away with, with money and private property so that, that women can then be more free to choose what sort of work they want to do. They may not choose to work in a caring field. They they may choose to be a scientist. They may choose to be a a farmer. They may choose to be anything. But that possibility is now open to them because they're they're no longer dependent on a man to hold up the the economic unit of the family, to be the the breadwinner that, that their life literally depends on, for him to go out into the world and bring back money for them to support themselves with doing away with that that sort of a, a system by doing away with private property. So that that's his point there. And here is the answer to the outcry of the highly moral Philistines against the, quote, community of women. Community of women is a condition which belongs entirely to bourgeois society and which today finds its complete expression in prostitution. But prostitution is based on private property and falls within it. Thus, communist society, instead of introducing community of women, in fact abolishes it. 
when he's talking about prostitution, how I interpret that is, is like I said, it's a financial transaction in his time for people to get married. The man is, is, is quite literally purchasing someone to have sex with because they are then economically dependent on him forever. He, and, and I'm sure the, the laws uh, across the UK and, 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 and the Western world were such at the time where there was no such thing as, as marital rape. There was no such thing as, and, and, and there was also, you know, huge social pressure against a woman ever deciding when she wanted to have sex. If that's the case, then, because the, the woman is now bound to the man in, in marriage, how is that really all that much different than having a, a live-in prostitute? In a very real sense, he gets the, the man gets to decide when sex happens, and there's a transaction that, in in return for for that and other services, the woman is is allowed to keep on living. She's given food and shelter and, and so forth. So, in a very real way, that can be looked at as as a form of prostitution, and, and that's where I believe he is he's criticizing it from. I think that's the angle he's coming from. 22. What will be the attitude of communism? Not to say that there's anything inherently wrong with sex work. Sex work is still labor and still should be compensated. It's just that you shouldn't have to, your life shouldn't depend on it, right? Your, your ability to make your way in the world shouldn't depend on, on having to do that. You should be able to make that choice as your profession rather than have it forced upon you as just a condition of your survival. Communism to existing nationalities. The nationalities of the peoples associating themselves in accordance with the principle of community will be compelled to mingle with each other as a result of this association and thereby to dissolve themselves, just as the various estate and class distinctions must disappear through the abolition of their basis, private property. 23. What will be its attitude to existing religions? All religions so far have been the expression of historical stages of development of individual peoples or groups of peoples. But communism is the stage of historical development which makes all existing religions superfluous and brings about their disappearance. 24. Does that mean that communism necessarily has to abolish by force religion? I don't think so. I think that as, as, as long, I mean, for one thing, people tend to like religion like, like there's, there's way more people that believe in one religion or another even if it's only a tenuous belief in it you know a casual belief in it the vast majority of people in every society around the world uh, from time immemorial believe in some religion right it's just something that people tend to to be attracted to for one reason or another to then force that away i think i think it does the the people a disservice it 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 would then rob them of the choice of belief or non-belief or or changing their belief to a, to a different religion or blending the religions uh and i think it dishonors them at the same time and i think it's 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 perfectly fine to to strike that balance then and say Whatever religion you believe in is fine. However you want to worship is fine, as long as you're not infringing on other people's rights, right? As, as long as you're not using it to reinstitute a hierarchy where you can get leverage over people, and, and as, as long as you are not, you know, uh, harming other people based on your own beliefs. I, I don't see what the problem with that could be. I think it could be perfectly compatible for a religious society. And I say that as, as a non-religious person myself. I don't have any particular religion that I believe in. I don't really consider myself to be a religious person, but I think it should be okay. I think it should at least be tolerated to a certain extent. Because um, it seems to be more or less the natural state of, of, of people. Uh, for better or for worse, it, it just seems to be that thing. So I think not allowing people to, to make that choice is, is not good, right? Doesn't, doesn't lead to a better society. How do communists differ from socialists? The so-called socialists are divided into three categories. 
reactionary socialists. This first category consists of adherents of a feudal and patriarchal society which has already been destroyed and is still daily being destroyed by big industry and world trade. And I, I, I apologize a lot, too. I didn't have the closed captioning on until just now. I, I don't know why it didn't register with me that it wasn't on, but um, I'm going to have it on for, for the rest of the, the book. In their creation, bourgeois society. This category concludes from the evils of existing society that feudal and patriarchal society must be restored because it was free of such evils. In so I don't think anyone would consider that a form of socialism now. Just the, the reactionary, we got to go back to monarchy. Uh, I think that would be a complete stretching to the point of breaking of the definition of socialism. But apparently in, in Engels' time, there were still people that called themselves socialists who wanted just a return of the old order. I would just call that monarchists. Um, yeah, that's, that's a much better term for that. In one way or another, all their proposals are directed to this end. This category of reactionary socialists, for all their seeming partisanship and their scalding tears for the misery of the proletariat, is nevertheless energetically opposed by the communists for the following reasons. Ah, uh, okay, so... From what I gather from that statement, the, these, these so-called socialists uh, were the people that would use their, their religious, perhaps their religious um, traditions or, or just a, a pining for the, the old days when they saw the proletariat better cared for, at least in their minds, uh, under a monarch or, or one of their lords. So their idea is that Modern society sucks. We should go back. It'll be better for the poor if we just go back to a, a monarchist sort of society. I think that's a, that's a dumb thing, and I still wouldn't consider that socialism myself. But that seems to be what he's what he's driving at when he categorizes this flavor of socialism. One, it strives for something which is completely impossible. Two, it seeks to establish the rule of the aristocracy the guild masters, the small producers, and their retinue of absolute or feudal monarchs, officials, soldiers, and priests. A society which was, to be sure, free of the evils of present-day society, but which brought with it at least as many evils without even offering to the oppressed workers the prospect of liberation through a communist revolution. Right, so peasants would have a guaranteed job. People that worked in a trade would, would have a guaranteed job. They'd have a way of, of making their bread. Um that they wouldn't necessarily have doing contract labor. You don't have a guarantee to just stand outside of a factory and, and be able to work and make a li and make enough money to live on. At least as a peasant, you would have had that, that, that guarantee. But of course it comes at the cost of, of everyone, every other of your freedoms. You have no chance of liberation. You never have a chance to uh, do anything else in your life. You, if you're a peasant or, or even a tradesperson, that's basically what you are. You're locked into that track forever. Three, as soon as the proletariat becomes revolutionary and communist, these reactionary socialists through, show their true colors by immediately making common cause with the bourgeoisie against the proletarians. Mm -hmm. Bourgeois socialists. Uh, so I think that's something that, that's uh, a phenomenon that's important to, to look out for then when we're looking at perhaps capitalism breaking down. Look for the people that are trying to make alliances with the current order, or who are talking about going back to, to previous orders. They're not, I mean, they're not your allies, right? They don't actually care about you. They just care about putting things back to some imagined better time. Um, and that should sound very f familiar because that, that's basically a, a large, Part of the essence of, of fascism really it's it's pining for an imagined time when when everything was in its right state and its right relationship and uh and at the same time railing against the perceived degeneracy of the modern world um these these are just the nazis of their time these people that that call themselves socialists but but just want to put back the monarchy and that order it's the second category consists of adherents of present-day society who have been frightened for its future by the evils to which it necessarily gives rise, 
What they want, therefore, is to maintain this society while getting rid of the... E These are the liberals of their day. Uh, put the right people in, in place, you know, enact the right policies, and the system will function just fine for everybody. And, and they say that. It's very easy for them to say that because they are themselves very comfortable in the current society. It's worked for them. So perhaps they delude themselves into believing or perhaps they genuinely believe that it could work for everyone, but it can't. And capitalism cannot work for everyone. It's, it's structurally organized to have the most benefit for the owners and the least benefit for the workers. And you have to have a lot more workers than you do owners. It, it couldn't, you couldn't have an entire boardroom that managed one single employee, right? That would make no sense. It's, 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 it has to be structured as a pyramid. And every time, and when you have a system full of pyramids, you're just by, by its structure going to have a very fall, very few, uh, very lucky few, uh, at the top. Uh, if you're, if you're, uh, even trying to, to organize a, a somewhat meritocratic society where, where, people rise up and, and um, can at least have a comfortable middle class life, you would have a much larger middle class section than the top. But always, always, always in capitalism, most people are going to be towards the bottom. It, it, that's just how it's structured. It's, it's structural inequality. That's, that's the entire economy of it. If you are a worker and, and you manage to, to become a, an owner, to be successful, you still have to structure things as, a, as a, another pyramid. You have to have other people to exploit in order to be successful Successful as uh, an owner. Unless you're just a, a one-man or one-person uh, independent contractor. But we can't all be that stuff. It, it, it just would not function. Capitalism would not function that way. You have to have the greatest amount of people being exploited for the benefit of the people on top. That, that's just how it's structured. There's no other way to do it. Evils, which are an inherent part of it. To this end, some propose mere welfare measures, while others come forward with... There you go. So, <clears throat> same sort of stuff that's, that's being pushed by um, SOC Dems, uh, Social Democrats. Just improve the welfare system to, to you know, smooth out the, the worst damage and excesses of, of the capitalist system. But really, when it comes down to it, even a robust welfare system, um, it, it, it's not it's not going to be enough to make up for the structural inequity. And in countries where it even comes close, they still have to exploit other people in order to provide enough money to keep that that robust of a welfare system going. Uh, while maintaining the capitalist system. So, so places like Sweden, very, very good. Eradicated homelessness in Sweden. Seems like, a, a, by all accounts, still a, a pretty cool uh, country to live in. At the same time, they, they still are reliant on exploitation of, of foreign countries in order to maintain their standard of living for everyone. With grandiose systems of reform, which under this pretense of reorganizing society, are in fact intended to preserve the foundations, and hence the life, of existing society. Communists must unremittingly struggle against these bourgeois socialists because they work for the enemies of communists and protect the society which communists aim to overthrow. Yep. And, and you will hear communists railing against liberals all the time. In fact, uh, I, I, maybe even the majority of leftists uh, tend to have a lot of disdain for liberals, even more disdain than for um, other people, because uh, they, they view liberals as, as getting in their way, right? They, they, they are responsible for things like the New Deal rather than a socialist revolution. Uh, they're responsible for welfare uh, being created rather than... An, producing an actual equitable society um, that provides for all just out of out of its its principles uh, 
so yeah so they they often are the the target you know and they were and they were the target even back then from uh communists uh so yeah but but it's important to remember that these liberals and and the same is true today more than anything they've gotten a good deal in the, in the current system so they more or less want to maintain it and they might feel bad for people that are less fortunate than them and and want to you know in essence toss a few coins towards them never enough to to really allow them to compete with them or, or really upend the system just enough to you know ease their guilt more than more than anything um Democratic socialists. Finally, the third category consists of democratic socialists who favor some of the same measures the communists advocate, as described in question 18, not as part of the transition to communism, however, but as measures which they believe will be sufficient to abolish the misery and evils of present day society. These democratic socialists are either proletarians who are not yet sufficiently clear about the conditions of the liberation of their class or they are representatives of the petty bourgeoisie, a class which, prior to the achievement of democracy and the socialist measures to which it gives rise, has many interests in common with the proletariat. It follows that in moments of... And that's basically the same as today. People that, that, that want to just get just beyond capitalism into a, like, like he says, democratic form of socialism, uh, uh, or democratic socialism, that is, same same sorts of group it seems to me as the people that are termed uh, dem socks today of action the communists will have to come to an understanding with these democratic socialists and in general to follow as far as possible a common policy with them provided that these socialists do not enter into the service of the ruling bourgeoisie and attack the communists it is clear that this form of cooperation and action does not exclude the discussion of differences so, so this would be seen as something today like uh, um, left unity, right? Everyone on the actual left wants to get past capitalism. We all have that same goal in common. So it's the idea of, of, of working with allies, even if they have a different idea of how to get there or how far to go um, or whether or not what they want is a transitional step or the end goal. We st still, because we all want to get past capitalism, make common cause with them. And, you know, I think that's a, a perfectly fine situation or a perfectly fine way of doing things uh, today as well. I, I definitely believe in, in left unity and um, seeking allies that have overall common cause. The upliftment, uh, the uplifting of, of, of humanity uh, and getting rid of uh exploitative forms of of uh, political systems as well as economic systems 25 what is the attitude of the communists to the other political parties of our time this attitude is different in the different countries in england france and belgium where the bourgeoisie rules the communists still have a common interest with the various democratic parties an interest which is all the greater the more closely the socialistic measures they champion approach the aims of the communists that is the more clearly and definitely they represent the interests of the proletariat and the more they depend on the proletariat for support in england for example the working class chartists are infinitely closer to the communists than the democratic petty bourgeoisie or the so-called radicals in america where a democratic constitution has already been established the communists must make the common cause with the party which will turn this constitution against the bourgeoisie and use it in the interests of the proletariat, that is, with the agrarian national reformers. In Switzerland, the radical... And I can't say I'm familiar with the agrarian national, national reformers. Could be talking about, like, a, a Democratic Farm Labor Party, uh, which, which eventually merged with the, the Democrats um, as, a, as a national party. I don't know. I'll have to look into that later on. Goals, though a very mixed party, are the only group with which the communists can cooperate. And among these radicals, the Vaudois and Genovese are the most advanced. In Germany, finally, the decisive struggle now on the order of the day is that between the bourgeoisie and the absolute monarchy. 
Since the communists cannot enter upon the decisive struggle between themselves and the bourgeoisie until the bourgeoisie is in power, it follows that it is in the interest of the communists to help the bourgeoisie to power as soon as possible in order the sooner to be able to overthrow it. So, so this comes from the idea of just the, the progress of history and how things have to go. And in his mind, in Engels' mind, you have to get to capitalism. Capitalism must necessarily overthrow the monarchy before it itself can be overthrown by communism. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think you could definitely skip that step, probably. Uh, I don't see why you couldn't just, as, as communists, overthrow the monarchy and then institute a... a, a communist system, but, but I'm sure he has his reasons for believing that it, it has to go in a certain stepwise fashion. Against the governments, therefore, the communists must continually support the radical liberal party, taking care to avoid the self-deceptions of the bourgeoisie and not fall for the enticing promises of benefits, which a victory for the bourgeoisie would allegedly bring to the proletariat. The sole advantages which the proletariat would derive from a bourgeois victory would consist, one, in various concessions which would facilitate the unification of the proletariat into a closely knit, battle-worthy and organized class, and two, in the certainty that, on the very day the absolute monarchies fall, the struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat will start. From that day on, the policy of the communists will be the same as it is now in the countries where the bourgeoisie is already in power. Yeah, what do you think about all this stuff? Do these, these bring up any new ideas for you? Um, is this a, a, a work that you've read before, this, this Principles of Communism? Do you have a better idea than, than you did coming in of what communism could be? Um, do you feel this is even relevant to current day? It, it might not be. You might feel that, that uh, there's been enough theory and, and um, articulation of, of leftist ideas since then that, that it's not really necessary anymore to have such a thing. Um, love to know. Haven't read it. All right. Good to know. Did, did you like it at all? Did, did it bring up any interesting ideas for you? I, I, I would agree that many of the ideas are timeless. The idea of class struggle is, is definitely something that we can still see today. The idea of capitalism just being inherently exploitative of, of workers, it's absolutely relevant to today. Uh, perhaps his, his ideas for revolution, like, like literal revolution, would have to be adjusted quite a bit uh, in light of, of current military strength. Like, um, basically, there's, there could be no revolution in the United States without a significantly weakened military or without a, a large chunk of the military joining the side of the revolutionaries. They're just way too powerful. I mean... You, you look at the comparisons. I'm sure you've seen them before. U.S. spends more on the military than the next 10 countries combined, I believe. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good point, Strin. Uh, times have changed, but the principles and, and contradictions remain basically the same. Absolutely. Capitalism has, has done great things in, in terms of... Uh, overturning monarchies and, and giving people more freedom in their lives to, than, than they would otherwise have. But I think it's, it's, it's run its course, you know, and, and it's getting to the point where uh, the, the wheels are probably going to fall off if, if there's not some major changes soon. Uh, yeah, I don't think he could have imagined how strong the U.S. military was. I mean, I'm sure no one of his time could have imagined things like atomic weapons. I mean, I, I believe in 1847 they were still fighting with things like muskets and and cannon, stuff like that. It'd be it'd be pretty hard to imagine a modern military from that point, or even just I mean, you got to remember there was no aircraft until what was it 1914? Uh, Kitty Hawk first flight. So there's, there's no aircraft until um, over 60 years past when this was written. The only air travel was by a uh, hot air balloon, and that was it. 
oh, you think it's up to the, the next 13 that, that the U.S. outspends? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and in terms of, of size, I think it's only China that has a larger standing army than the Uni United States. It's just monstrous. And the amount of money we spend on it is, is grotesque. Uh, but that may end up being part of the U.S.'s downfall if we don't redirect that money because there's a lot of people in need and it's it's things are only getting worse really in, in terms of people's economic prospects and future yeah and and we came really close that that brings up a, a, a good issue that happened recently we came really close recently to there being a seismic shift in in um, the amount of need that that people have and and uh when, when uh, I'll just I'll just put it out there, Congress finally reauthorized an extension of the the uh, rental eviction ban nationwide. Had they not done that, and and suddenly millions of people were out on the streets because there was a lot of states that had nothing in in place to protect the the rental eviction ban. If suddenly millions of people were out on the streets, that would cause a seismic shift in in the political calculus and it definitely could be uh if it were directed right it could definitely could bring a lot of people into the left very quickly fortunately they they, they continued the the program I, I don't want people to be homeless uh of course that's that's not a good thing for anybody but but had they not done that they, they would have been facing millions of of almost people all at once because a lot of people are very behind on their rent in the U.S. because of uh, COVID. So what is the balance between spending and the earnings? The U.S. earns a lot of money in the Middle East or at least have been earning since the 90s. Uh, okay. So are you saying that... Uh, is, the, is the point you're trying to make that to have uh, protections for people... For the basic necessities, we, we have to. Um, what's the next 11 countries? Uh, are, are you trying to say that, that in order to have protections for people, um, for housing, we, we have to be making this money in the Middle East? Um, there's definitely some truth to, to that sort of an argument. Uh, we make a lot of money by exploiting people around the world. At the same time, we have more, way more than enough housing right now for everybody. And... If we, at the very least, decommodified housing and, and started a, a massive program of, of uh, building more housing at the local level for people that, that needed it the most, um, I, I don't see why we couldn't continue that program on. I don't see why we couldn't house everybody just fine. And, and you know, when it gets down to it, money is, is, is put towards one thing or another. And, and money is also a, a social construct. It, it, it only has the value that we, we place upon it. So we could decide that, that it's more important for people to just have housing and we could assemble materials and, and build them houses, whether or not there's, there's technically money for it. And also we could just redirect a lot of the things that we waste a lot of money on, uh, trying to topple any sort of left-wing movement around the world that, that crops up. We could stop doing all that and divert that money. Uh, so you're talking about spending, and I'm asking about, and you're asking about earnings. Plus, the goal of the state is not being profitable, but satisfying citizen needs. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. That 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 should be the goal of the state is is not to be profitable. Um, I I think we can definitely achieve enough abundance for everyone in in all of the basics of of uh, life. I don't think there's any problem with that. Yeah, we produce enough food to feed 10 billion people, and we only have 7.5. Yeah. Some of that is, is distribution, but a lot of that has to do with capitalism. If, for example, you, you are a milk producer, and you can't get a good enough price for your milk uh, to the point where it would cost you more to distribute that milk uh, and, and try and, and sell it to, to wherever, it would cost you more to transport that milk than, than you would actually make in the profit, you may end up just dumping your milk out in the field. Uh, same could be true of any sort of food. 
because it's all dependent on price. If we were instead producing food based on need and we were just through a, a feeling of mutual aid giving to people whatever they, they said that they needed, um, yeah, and that's a good point too. We produce food in the wrong way and we consume in the wrong way. I, I think that's that's definitely true, uh, Zeus. I, I think, do you want to just be called Zeus? That, um, yeah, we could we could do a lot better. And if we were producing, not for profit, but but for need, you know, there'd be a lot less waste just because of that. Um, if we we're producing in a more thoughtful way, using what I've what I've mentioned with with permaculture ethics and principles, uh, yeah. We, we, if, so, so we're doing that with permaculture principles. We could produce enough for everybody. There could be plenty of abundance and. Also, at the same time, make our, our food system a lot more resilient. Um, just Zeus is fine? Okay, cool. So you, you say, uh, produce, say, a thousand chickens using hormones um, and things like that, and that shouldn't happen. Yeah. If, you, if you're looking at, at food as just another product, like, like any other sort of thing, and you're organizing industry, your food industry as, as just another factory then yeah, everything else goes out the window. Um, animal welfare, uh, the, the waste that comes along with the, the way that particularly chickens in, in the U.S. are, are kept and, and, and uh, raised and um, forced to, to grow too big for their own legs in certain breeds and all that sort of thing. Um, if you're doing it that way, then, then yeah, there's... there's there's bound to be a lot of waste because there's bound to be a lot of death. Just restructuring, reorienting things towards people's needs, then I think we could, yeah, I think we could produce a much healthier system for, for every living thing involved. Absolutely. And so many industries are heavily subsidized and not always, in, in, the, in the case of agriculture, that's not always for uh, even food production. Uh, it could be, you know, corn is one of the most subsidized things in the country. And the, the, um, the uses of corn are, are, I think, first and foremost for animal feed, I think it goes. Uh, and then it goes to export. And then it's like ethanol. And then like way, way down the list, it's actual, I mean, the corn syrup is in there too. And then like near the bottom of the list is, is the corn that actually goes towards real food, like like in terms of, you know, made into cornmeal, corn on the cob, canned corn, all that sort of thing. That's way down on the list. Uh, and in large part because it's been commodified so much. So there's, there's price guarantees. And it's one reason that a lot of people grow it, because they know that they will get a profitable price for it. They have uh, guaranteed from the, the government. Um, if we're not even talking about profit, though, if we're just talking about need and producing for that, um, you wouldn't have to have nearly as many corn growers or soy growers or any of these, these large staple crops. But yeah, if you're if you're producing for need and for for long term sustainability, uh, and and resilience, you don't have to have these vast monocropped fields, and you could reorient a lot of your food production towards a lot of different foods that that people. Uh, you know, would would uh, get to like more, perhaps even. Yeah, total liberation does include animals. Absolutely true. Uh, not to say that everyone has to be vegan, and I would agree with that too. I'm not myself a vegan, although I do try to avoid factory farming whenever I can. Um, but in general, they need to be decommodified, yeah. And in using permaculture principles, you know, Part of that care for the earth includes caring for the living parts of the earth. If you're just exploiting uh, whatever animal it is in the same way that you would exploit a, a, a worker of your own, then you're not really caring for the earth. I, I would say not. So just by adopting those permaculture principles, we can move in a direction that, that is better for uh, every animal that's involved in the system. And, and again, when we're, we're moving away from just doing things for profit, we're not trying to maximize the amount of chickens that we can pack together or, or any sort of 
uh, feed, uh, food animal, um, they're going to end up living better lives just, just by that fact, just by that reorientation. So you say, Zeus, unfortunately, you don't see how they can, uh, we can solve this because the world population will continue to grow. And the development of, uh, you say that the, the population will continue to grow uh, with the development of the undeveloped countries. They will start to consume more and more. Uh, it's not a way back. Uh, the threats of population overreach are mostly due to capitalism. Yes, absolutely true. If the entire world lived the way that Americans lived and consumed the way that Americans consumed, we would need several planets to support the amount of raw material uh, for all of our, our products that we use. But that, but, but that configuration is, is largely due to consumer capitalism and um, the idea of being hyper-efficient at the expense of resiliency. So maybe hyper efficient and, and cost effective to produce a lot of single use stuff in, in plastics and, and have a lot of waste um, just in the name of, of having a standardized product that you can get at an affordable price. Uh, but if we change the system that we're operating under, you know, not everyone has to live the way, I mean, Americans shouldn't live the way we live, to be honest. And and no matter where you watch country you look at yeah right to repair is a good one too if we get a ri get rid of these these uh ideas of intellectual private property then too we could uh do away with these um disposable consumer uh sort of supply chain and mentality um but yeah by by reorienting ourselves towards towards different goals rather than just uh having a lot of really cheap consumer goods and, and food and stuff like that, then the entire world doesn't have to live like the U.S. and neither does the U.S. itself have to live like we currently do. We can, we can make an entire change uh, in the way we live, in the way we live on the planet. And it, it's one reason I think it's, it's so critical to bring in these permaculture ideas. I have, I've, I'm up to, I think, uh, my fourth video on, on, Permaculture 101 um, should be coming out tomorrow. I just finished the third one, and I'll get that one and the fourth one out. And I think it's it's super critical to start folding these ideas from permaculture into leftist theory. If we're going to imagine a, a world remade in the name of, of uplifting people and providing for them and having the most people live their highest and best lives, we can't live... We can't leave out the ecological component, and I think the 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 theory that that best addresses that ecological component is permaculture, and I think the theory that best addresses the way that we configure human societies uh, in a more community oriented and equitable way is new urbanism. So I try to I try to bring all these ideas in together when when I talk about these things. Uh, Material doesn't always lend itself to to bringing these ideas in, but I but I try where I can, and I think it's it's critical to not just take uh, ideas that were very much based in in the ethos of the industrial revolution from 150 years ago. Not just take those ideas and and go with them, but to to take on the the entire field of ecology uh, and and other sciences that have come to learn a lot more about our impact on the world and how much we can or cannot impact uh, our own environment and stuff like that. So permaculture, I think, is one good way to, to bring that in. Yeah, planned obsolescence wouldn't necessarily be a thing either if you're not talking, if you're not trying to generate a market based on, on your stuff literally breaking, you know, two or three years after it, it comes out. Um, just that you can squeeze more profit out. Uh, yeah, you could reorient reorient things to be uh, durable, durable for a lifetime. Uh, there, there's so much can, that that can be switched out in terms of electronics without having to to ditch the entire uh, system. You know, uh, we don't have to we don't have to destroy, you know, discard our phones every few years. It doesn't have to be that sort of a system. 
we could have it where we just get a, a system update uh, that that actually works that doesn't slow it down to to plan that obsolescence or just switch out a component or two um, there's ways to live lighter and and still have some of at least some of these these consumer comforts that we've come to rely on these tools of communication because communication still is an important part of human survival and and uh, and its ability to to thrive okay so you say that uh, math is the issue in the US uh, plus the EU are the top consumers more than at least uh, more capitalists they together are at least okay I'm, I'm getting lost in your sentence there let me try that again. E are the top consumers, more at least, the more capitalist they together are less than 10% of the world population. So when the other 90%, 90% starts to act like us. So together, the, the U.S. and the EU, EU are less than 10% of the world population. Uh, so when the other 90% start acting like them... Uh, will be a question of 10 to 15 years to literally the end of the world. Well, to the end of the world as we know it. I mean, some some people are still going to end up surviving for sure. Uh, there'll be more and less advantageous places to live in the world. But but yeah, a lot, a lot of a lot of people will die if if everyone lived like the U.S. So, yeah, th so that, that's part of the urgency towards pulling out of this capitalist system, because if we just keep on this capitalist system, that we have that that pushes greater and greater levels of consumption year after year and and, and you know if more and more people are adopting it then yeah we're, we're we're a train running towards the edge of a cliff and there's nothing we can do to stop it if we instead reorient society to to uh be more equitable as as and at the same time pull in these these ideas of of permaculture uh and new urbanism and reorganize our, our societies politically, physically, and ecologically, I, I think we have a chance uh, to, to have a good standard of life, good standard of living, um, to all be able to have a platform uh, with, with all our, uh, made of all of the necessities that we need to sustain our life, that we can then stand up on and live our highest and best purposes I think we can have all those things while at the same time having less of an impact on the earth. Um, and the more we go into permaculture, the more we embrace that, the more we are becoming a, a, a co-creator of our ecosystems around us and a co-regenerator of the ecosystems around us. I think if we embrace that more, along with these other ideas, we do stand a chance of, of pulling out of this tailspin maybe even reducing some of the damage that climate change is already doing uh, within our lifetime. I, I think that's definitely a possibility. It's not actually 90%. You have Australia, Japan, and South Korea, same levels of them. But you get, yeah, I definitely get the idea of what you're saying. And yeah, if nothing changes, capitalism, consumer capitalism just rolls along as it is, we're doomed either way. Even if the rest of the world doesn't adopt our practices, the, the more industrialized countries will ruin this entire world to the point where there's going to be mass death. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the promise that, that, that continuing on with the status quo sort of a system is, is giving us. So that, that's, that shouldn't be an option, really. We have to look at reorienting, reorienting everything top, top to bottom, really, in order to avoid that sort of a catastrophe. Oh, I see. Uh, English is not your first language, Zeus. That, that, that's totally fine. I, I'm, I'll just uh, yeah, do my best to, to try and get a, try and figure out what you're getting at. So Black Lion 99 says, watched Obama's win like last 2012. Best thing happened to the U.S. Are you are you are you saying Obama was the best thing that happened to the U.S. Because Mm -mm. I, I got to disagree with that. He may have been a very personable guy who, who said the right thing at least some of the time. He also was the guy that, that super upped drone strikes around the world, killed a lot of people. Um, I guess one good thing is you could say he didn't get us into any more wars. 
but he still meddled in a lot of countries. He still eroded privacy quite a bit. He was, I mean, he's kind of the quintessential neoliberal sort of president. Says a lot of, of, of things that, that sound nice, um, but then acts in a way that, that is not great. I mean, he deported hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, maybe he wasn't as bad, and he certainly wasn't as bad as, as, as Trump in a lot of ways, but definitely not as cruel. But, they, they, I mean, there were kids in cages under his watch as well. He didn't have child separation, but he still treated immigrants very poorly. Yeah, I, he's, he's, I don't know. He's, he's not something to look up to. Yeah, Obama bad, actually. A lot of, a lot of comments coming in. I'm going to try and do my best to, to keep up. Uh, you can't have communism as a world system. Communism is for, forbidden in some European countries. Well, I mean, technically communism is forbidden in the U.S. as well. And that's why communists will tell you that there has to be some sort of a revolution uh, for it to be in, in place. My, my personal preference would be to instead create parallel institutions in the, the rotting husk of capitalism's body while there still are the resources available to us. Um, so parallel institutions that would take up the slack where the government is failing. Institutions where we would give people housing and food and other forms of mutual aid uh, to remedy all these problems that... that capitalism is is inflicting on us at the same time winning over more people to our side and and showing the promise of a more egalitarian free and democratic society that we would then build so that when the time comes for capitalism to fall apart completely well there's a major when when there's a major seismic shift we'll be there to you know carry things on in any more productive and and uh, kinder direction. Only way to change is for everyone to change too. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it starts with just little things like this, just talking about different ideas, different possibilities. I think that really is how long-term change happens. It's it's just like the, the, the permaculture principle to use small and slow solutions. It starts just by dreaming of what's possible, and then it goes to conversations with more people, and then it goes to maybe small actions and those actions can build on themselves to become even bigger actions and then over time with a lot of people all agreeing to uh, more or less the, the same sort of a system we can get to a point where real change can happen and enough people can can be on board with that change for it to be lasting and and you know have a, a great impact on people's lives. I think that's definitely possible. Uh, and today you voted for Biden in 2020. Okay. Um, I ended up voting for Biden as well. I'll be honest. Um, it didn't seem like a, a viable protest vote. I would have, you know, had we had ranked choice voting or proportional representation, I would have voted for the Green Party and Howie Hawkins first or perhaps i would have even looked into some more socialist and communist parties um but uh of the two options that were available i felt it was more important to stave off actual fascism from getting an even tighter grip on the country than it was to also oppose neoliberalism and you know i'm not i'm not proud of voting for biden in any way i, I don't think it it I don't think he's helping the world at all. I don't think he's helping the U.S. at all. He he gave us one paltry check, and that's that's about all that he's done. Otherwise, you know, I, I have more important things to focus on because I don't put any stock in his ever saving us from anything or making this country any better. He's a, he's a, he's a pack of empty, emptiness and and lies, really. So what's the goal? Well, I mean. The goal is to, to enact some sort of, or to bring about some sort of a leftist society, whether it's communism, anarchy, socialism, just something beyond, something beyond capitalism, where people's basic needs are met and where they have more freedom and control over uh, their workplace and their means of production. That's, that's what the goal is, right? 
And then my goal also is to fold in these other ideas of permaculture and new urbanism to make those leftist ideas more strong, robust, and, and applicable to modern day conditions. Yeah, Obama was very imperialist. He's, he's, he was not a great president, um, even though he said a lot of, you know, he had that soaring oratory that he could uh, fool people with. But if you look at the actions he took, I mean, I give him some credit for at least trying for universal health care. But when it came down to it, he didn't pull it across the finish line. So, you know, kind of a letdown. Or, or he definitely was a big letdown, actually. Yeah, not a fan of libs or conservatives here. European Union liberals, the, the term is, is different from the United States. Liberals in the United States are basically conservatives anywhere else in the world. They, they believe in neoliberalism. They believe in capitalism and not much of a safety net, um, except for the, the very most progressive wing of the Democrats or liberals. Yeah, at, at best, they believe in a more robust social safety net and not a whole lot else. But yeah, they would be considered on the right anywhere else. Liberals are on the right side. That, that's a good way of looking at it. They want you know, free market stocks and, and maybe because of some uh, maybe because of some guilt or whatever, they want things to be a little bit better for the less fortunate than themselves. Yeah, anyone who supports capitalism, perfect way to, to look at it, in my opinion. Government pushing the vaccine, is that considered fascism? Just pushing a vaccine, would I don't see how you could call that fascism. Uh, wanting to provide for public health, and I really don't see how that could be considered fascism. Even if they were to go as far as to mandate vaccines to be in any sort of public space at all, to, to leave your house. Thank you so much for following Black Lion 99 uh, Even if they were to go so far as to, to mandate vaccines to be in any public space, to do anything basically but leave your house, I still wouldn't call that fascism. Fascism is, is more an appeal to an imagined past uh, where things were in the right order and the right people were on top and a, a, a wanting to uh, sweep away the, the, the perceived degeneracy of the day. Um, it's the intertwining of, of business, often religion, and uh, government in, into, you know, for, for use of whatever ends they want, usually to um, put one race or another on top uh, to the detriment to everyone else. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see how that could be called fascism in any sense of the word. Yeah, you voted for anti-racism, that's the reason you voted for Biden. Well, yeah, me too. I, I didn't want our country to slip further into fascism. I was already scared with how, how far it went. Yeah, Biden vote was definitely just a stopgap while we try and think of better ways of actually changing our country. Oh, so you want to know if, if Reagan was better than Kennedy or the other way around? Reagan was one of the worst presidents in history, in my opinion. He solidified uh, neoliberalism as the 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 way the government was going to go until really the present day. And, and only recently, since basically 2016, has there been any sort of pushback against the neoliberal march of shredding social safety nets, uh, giving away whatever they can to big business with the hopes of trickle-down economics, which is a farce. Um, yeah, Reagan was the worst. Kennedy was not a great president either. Yeah, probably would have gotten us into Vietnam had he not been assassinated. You know, he again, he had some soaring or oratory, but I don't know what it was he actually did that was all that great. Um, unless the government is nationalizing a company, isn't manda mandating a private company's product considered fascism since they're in bed with the private company? I mean, that's a... It's a very... It's a very unique situation because we're not we wouldn't be doing it for anything beyond this one vaccine, right? It's not as though we're going to then mandate every single vaccine that's out there because of that. We're just trying to get a handle on a huge public health crisis that has already killed over 600,000 Americans and wounded for, you know, eight months or more, um, for perhaps life, tens and tens of thousands more people. That, that, have, that have survived COVID but have had long-lasting um, effects from it. 
I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a unique situation and it's not something that would be the long term uh, model of the day if it were to go through as, as some sort of mandatory thing. Uh, do I believe in the term, two term limit, limit for presidents? I believe in limiting all power as much as possible. So yeah, term limits for every level of government. Absolutely true. There's always some other government position you can go to once your limits are up. I think just a general rule of thumb, if, if you can't get a significant portion of your agenda done within 10 years, then it's, it's time to just step aside and let someone else fill that position. Uh, yeah, limiting power is good. Limiting power is, is a good thing. Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher, the couple that, that uh, established their views for the next decades, yeah, and they did more to destroy unions by, by breaking the strike of the air traffic controllers union. They did more to destroy unions than, than virtually any other president, and that they, they precipitated what's, what's happened today, where we have very low union participation because of that. Uh, yeah, horrible people, horrible policies, uh, not good for the world. Yeah, uh, there's, there's no defending them at all on any level. Yeah, they definitely left their imprint on the world, stranded. That, that's absolutely true. Term limits shouldn't exist. People should always be free to run. Uh, yeah, I would disagree. I think that that leads to entrenched power, and I'm against long-term entrenched powers. Um, that le that leads to people like Mitch McConnell uh, being basically undefeatable. Uh, and I mean, think of any terrible congressperson or senator or president. What, what if we had unlimited terms for Trump or, or Reagan or whatever? Oh, could you imagine still living under? Uh, well, I mean, Reagan's dead, but could you imagine him still being president up through the 90s into the 2000s when he finally kicked the bucket? That would be horrible. Uh, Nancy Pelosi. Why should she get to run forever? Just because she spends most of her time most of her time campaigning, like like she literally spends the majority of her time campaigning and raising funds. Do I dislike the Electoral College? Absolutely. Uh, AKA a Democratic Republic. Uh, yeah, I am always in favor of moving things more towards direct democracy as, as much as, as humanly possible. I, I like the idea of spreading out power as much as possible. I think the Senate should be abolished as an institution. It, it does nothing but, but throttle progress. Uh, the Electoral College is the same way. The only way that, that, that conservatives can still win in this country is, is structurally through uh, just the fact that the Electoral College gives them more power than their numbers deserve. I believe one person, one vote is, is spreading out power as much as possible. So, yeah. Uh, mob rule. Yeah, that's funny. So if you don't want uh, a rule by the majority... Do you want rule by the minority instead? Is that a better way of doing things? I don't really think so. I, I, especially with the people that are in power right now. Uh, we, should, we should increase the numbers for Congress as well. It should be tracked towards U.S. population. And, and at the very least, you know, have something like one congressional seat can't represent more than 100,000 people. Like even that's a lot of people to represent. But, yeah, we should expand Congress. Uh, rule by the most populous cities? Well, it's not as those cities are a monolith, though, either, is it? It's one person, one vote. It's, it's democracy. Yeah, I don't want to have rule by the countryside either, if you want to look at it that way. Do you want to have rule by the least populous places? Because that's how we have now. They all have an outsized vote. Why do they deserve an outsized voice? because they have less population, but more land. I don't, I don't follow how that's a better way of doing things. I gotta get uh, off the stream now though. I, I promised my wife that I would be done by, by 10 o'clock my time and, and here I am going on beyond that point. But I encourage you guys to, to keep thinking about these ideas. Um, yeah, think about just living in a more democratic society where, where power is shared more evenly, what the possibilities could be. Thank you very much, Zeus99. 
uh, PT for, for following. I've, I've enjoyed your contributions to this discussion, and I thank you very much, and I hope to see you. I hope to see all of you, in fact, this, this Sunday, where I think I'm going to be doing, I, I think I've decided I'm going to do part five of my Intro to Permaculture series of, of videos. So if you're interested in learning more about permaculture, uh, join me. I, I, it's probably going to be around 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, but um, if not, I will announce either on Facebook, well, probably both on Facebook and on Twitter, if, if it's not. So the majority of the people, it doesn't matter where those people are from. I agree. Yeah. Good, good way of putting it. Why should it matter where a person's from? Why should they get more or less power based on where they live? That doesn't make sense to me. Um, it's just an anti-urban way of looking at things to say, well, we're just going to have rule by urban people. Am I rating out? Yes, I'm rating out. If you have anyone that you'd like me to rate into, now is the time to make your suggestions. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll pick from, from people that I follow myself. But I always enjoy learning about new people that I maybe don't follow yet. Uh, and I always enjoy um, just supporting more cool leftists. So especially if you have a leftist in mind, it doesn't have to be that, though. Um, as long as it's not some sort of right-wing chud, I'm, I'm definitely open to rating just about anybody. Yeah, if, if the majority had their way, they, they probably wouldn't vote for the same things that the minority votes for now, right? Of course. The, 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 it's not a coincidence that um, the, the U.S. Senate is referred to as the Millionaires Club, because you basically have to be a millionaire in order to raise enough money and have enough money to sustain a campaign to become a senator and continue to be a senator. I don't want to have rule by those people. I don't, I don't have any trust that they're going to have my best interests at heart. They're going to want to keep the system as it is because it's done so well for them. It's nothing sinister necessarily, but they just, it's done good for them. So, so why not keep it going? I think that's, that's how they look at things. Uh, okay. So we get a, a troll here at the end. Is that, is that how, did you, did you have fun trolling there? Do you have a, a little moment of time where people are looking at your dumb comment? I, I hope that, uh, worked out for you <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So if you have anyone in mind, you'd like me to raid. Yeah. I'll probably just, yeah, probably just ban you. Anyone you'd like me to raid. Now's the, the, your chance to shout it out. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Uh, turn TV visions that I don't vibe with your random weirdo rap that you just throw at the, in the middle of my stream without any context or applicability to anything we're talking about. It's so weird. Comrade Gomer. Okay, I'm going to look that up right now. And we'll raid into them. Thank you so much for the suggestion, String. Oh, doing State and Revolution. That's cool. That's definitely, that's one book I haven't read, but I've heard that, that pretty much anyone who uh, decides to, to make the choice to do the, the, the ML side or whatever um, finds really inspiring. Like, like that, that book comes up again and again. Uh, and they're talking about the dictatorship of the proletariat. Very cool. We're going we're gonna to raid out to Comrade Gomer, and you can check out what they're talking about. Let them know where you came from. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for joining me. That, that, it's been so nice chatting with all of you. And, and I hope to see you in, in future streams very much. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and as I end most of my streams, Lectam.